Hello, you're listening to Talk of Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined here with Chris. Yo. And today's episode is our reviews of the spring 2024 anime season part two. We have Kaiju number eight, Dungeon Meshi, Train to the End of the World, The Banner's Former Hero, A Salad Bowl of Eccentrics, Girls Band Cry, Oi Thombo, uh, Odisei Yatsura, 2002 second season. I don't know. It's that new one that's the second season, but whatever. Tanari no Yokai-san and Mysterious Disappearances. So, cool stuff. Chris is on board with at least two of those. He's going to go solo on one, yeah. which I did laugh about last week. So I'm just laughing about the same thing I laughed about last week. So <laughs> just keep bringing it up because it's a joke that I don't have much jokes. I have to work with what I have. <laughs> but yes, we're at TalkingSpirit.com. That's where you can go for all of our links, social media links, ways to get a hold of us, ways to support us. We greatly appreciate everybody's sports channel. But yes, let's just dive right into it. Kicking things off with Kaiju number eight, which was on Crunchyroll and, and Twitter. They just like some really cool thing where they did like live stream on Twitter and then said go to Crunchyroll for it, which I thought they were going to leave it on Crunch on Twitter, but apparently they just live streamed it, which seemed to have done really well, especially for Japan, because obviously they like they like Twitter in Japan. So anyways, that aside, Production IG worked on it based on a manga action adventure sci fi. And yeah, this one opens up with a guy named Kafka and he works. He had dreams and ambitions with his childhood friend to become a part of the like this Japanese self-defense force that's for kaiju specifically. And yeah, they grow up together and he doesn't become one. He becomes part of the cleanup crew because he keeps failing the test to become one. Well, his childhood friend becomes one. She becomes a captain. She's very popular, but yeah, it kind of follows him as he's doing the cleanup crew to clean up these massive kaiju that die in the middle of the city. And then eventually at some point after a kaiju appears from out of the, under the ground, attacks him and this other guy that's trying to become a member of the uh, the defense force, attacks them, they fight it off for a little bit or at least run away from it, and then he gets a little injured, cut, they get saved the next day, or cut to the hospital, and they're recovering, and this kaiju insect thing, <laughs> I'm just going to call it an insect because I'm not sure if they have actually specified that it's a kaiju, but I think it's obviously a kaiju, appears before him, it's like this bug, jumps down his throat, and turns him into a kaiju. And then it turns into him basically trying to run from everybody and try to hide the fact that he's a kaiju because he can transform back and forth. Eventually, he goes to become a part of the defense force again, actually passes it, and joins the actual defense force. And all the while trying to hide the fact that he is what they deem kaiju number eight. Because at some point, they they started investigating, found there's this other kaiju, and they, they claim it kaiju number eight. Which is based on, like, the, the ones that are actually numbered are like the kaiju that are really powerful so obviously based on the fact that he's kaiju number eight there's seven more that are like really powerful that have been in the past so yeah they have to wear these like little suits that are seemingly made of the kaiju skin or at least parts from the kaiju um some of them have weapons that are from the kaiju and they fight the kaiju so that's the setup so far and um yeah i was based on the pv alone i was pretty excited for so did you ever get a chance to actually watch a single episode of it mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like a, I won't say it's like a turn off your brain and type, a type of action show. It's just kind of one of those shows that I think does really well in kind of doing something different. I think the, the biggest appeal to it is that you don't have a whiny, <laughs> you know, teenager kid that is the main hero. This is a guy that's, I think he's in his thirties. <laughs> like he's old. He's, he's a dinosaur in anime years. So it was kind of refreshing to once for once have a. A cast of, well, a, an adult. The, they're all not all adults, but he is an adult. And so it's kind of nice to actually have him in character that's an adult. Um, his his friend that he was doing the cleanup crew with, that he joined up with, he's like in, he's he's much much younger. Everybody else is seemingly younger. Mina is like a little bit younger than she than he is, but she's probably in her 20s. So again, it's kind of nice to have for once have a, a cast of characters that aren't a bunch of teenagers. And I think even the younger ones are going to be like late teens probably turning into their 20s so it's a kind of refreshing thing to have like a cast that um i guess for a lot of anime fans they can relate to but not so much that it's just more so the idea that you don't have to get through all the angsty teenager stuff that you typically get with these series you typically have to deal with characters that are whining about not getting in the robot or whining about parent problems or something like that he's just kind of a a joe schmo a, a guy that was trying for a future and a dream that he wanted and absolutely failing at it because he couldn't pass the test um, but anyways, that aside, the the initial appeal that I had for the show was obviously the OP, or the, not the OP, the PVs. The PVs looked great. I mean, the music was fantastic. You had, like, crazy action and animation. 
Um, and it would just look like it was going to be a, again, I, initially I thought it was going to be a turn off your brain watch action. But what I actually got from it was, again, a very likable main character. Kafka is a, is a cool guy. You just kind of want to root for him. He's a little, despite the fact that, again, like I said earlier, it is an adult rather than a angsty teenager that you typically get. He is sort of juvenile at some points. Like, he is a little bit, he's a goofster. Like, he is a goofball. But he's a, he's not, again, like, he doesn't have all the angst in there with the goofballness. And that kind of makes uh, sense with the other characters because anybody that's around him, especially early on, it just feels like a bunch of goofballs that are hanging out together. It's like the bros. They're hanging out together, and then when the fight starts, they get in action. They get their suits on, they jump in there and start fighting things. Um, I actually appreciate it for that. I will admit that like, early on, obviously, the, pre the what they present you with is he's a kaiju now, and thus... Everybody's gonna want him dead. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna trust a kaiju. They have destroyed plenty of things. They kill a lot of things. Um, they just, they cause havoc. So if they ever find out that he's a kaiju, obviously they're gonna want him dead. And so initially, it's like seriously, crap. I'm a kaiju. I have to hide this fact. So anytime that he, he has a a person that's in danger, obviously the question mark comes up. Do you go out there? He himself never questions it. Like if there's somebody in danger, he just immediately jumps to it, and he and which is. <laughs> Kind of, I guess, uh, balanced by the fact that his friend uh, Reno doesn't want him to. Like, every time somebody's in danger, he's like, dude, you got to get out of here. You can't. The, the, the defense force is going to show up, and if they, they spot you, they're going to kill you. He doesn't question it. Like, he doesn't even, like, hesitate. He immediately runs out there, saves a kid or something like that. Um, but, yeah, in, the underplot is really his desire to stand aside his childhood friend Mina. And so most of the show is really him. I'm going to stand at your side. I'm going to do that. Like, even at, the, even at their, like, an award ceremony, he literally yells out loud, I'm here, Mina. I finally made it. And she's just like, dude, shut up. <laughs> Get down and do push-ups. You're embarrassing me. Um, there's that whole thing that's kind of the subplot of it. And like I said, it's, it's a lot of build-up to him trying to hide his identity. And I will admit that at some point, I felt like that was going to get old. Like, the, the idea of constantly trying to hide who he is and constantly talking to people and them saying, you need to hide who you are. Somebody might get wind of it, and then suddenly he has to talk to them, and they're going, dude, that's, thanks for saving my life, but nobody can find out about this. They're going to tear you apart. They're going to do experiments on you. They're going to rip you to pieces and use you as weapons. So it's constantly that. And I will admit that at some point I got, I got tired of that. <laughs> I was like... I kind of want them, it, it, it's kind of a unique thing, but at the same time, like, I kind of just want them to just, just reveal it already. I don't know that I really want to have, like, a, a, a shonen epic uh, that's just nothing but constantly trying to hide, and will he get found out being the question mark constantly. So, thankfully, they got, they got around that in a way. I won't say exactly how, but they got around that in a way, so that kind of went to the wayside. But, like, the deeper story seems to be, like, suddenly the appearance of intelligent kaiju. They're not, they're not, I won't say they're intelligent, but they can talk. <laughs> they can talk and they can, they can hide amongst the people. Like they can transform themselves and they do have communication, but it's like, but they're not, they're not in, intelligent question mark. There's one that seemingly they reveal at the very end of this core, which obviously this isn't it. Um, I think they already announced the second season. Um, at the very end of this core, they did reveal one that was seemingly like really intelligent because you had like a bunch of screens with a bunch of games of chess or something like that playing at the same time so he's playing a whole bunch of games of chess um so i'm assuming they're gonna get more and more into more intelligent kaiju and how that can kind of change the game i do have a fear of it getting a little bit too typical shonen which it's already kind of in that area but it's just a lot more entertaining than i typically get and i think again that's because it's not constantly teenager angst comedy and stuff like that um but so far it's, it's doing really well visually it was great i, I think through Pretty much the entire show, it looked really good. The action scenes were really great. Um, there is some strategy to some of the fights, and that does play into Kafka because he he was doing the cleanup crew for so long. He knows the ins and outs of every single kaiju. <laughs> so whenever there is a fight and he's like, oh, I kind of see how this body part is laid out here. So obviously the core is probably going to be right here. And so he'll do a call out saying, hey, aim for this part. It's probably going to be the weak spot. Or, hey... These things typically have very tough, you know, chests or whatever. Try to shoot it from behind. And so he'll strategize with people because he's so knowledgeable of the entire body structure of these things that they've had to cut up. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing disposal for a dragon kaiju and you're always running into the problem where your blades are getting destroyed by the skin or the front side of it, you'll know that, oh, yeah, we always cut from the back end. So obviously he'll tell them that. So why the... <laughs> 
I say that, but it's like, why the re- these people that are trained to do nothing but fight kaiju don't know that? That's another question mark. But it, again, it gives a little bit of extra spice to him being, you know, spending most of his life, well, not most of his life, but his adult life, cutting them up for a living. So it, it's interesting. I, I think it looks good. Uh, music. There was like one track they used somewhere where I was like, Ugh, I don't like this type of music, but that's a taste thing. I think overall, like a lot of the action scenes, the music just ramps up and it's really great. So overall, I really enjoyed it. It was a it was a pleasant surprise to me. And again, I think that's a lot to do with just a, a good cast of characters. They're fun characters. I will agree with some people. I think some of the character designs are a little bit too ant-faced, I guess is the best way to put it. They're a little bit too ant-faced. Like, like uh, Mina's kind of a little bit less off-putting, but, like, Kikoro is, like, it, it, she looks like a character out of, I don't know, an ant's life or something like that. She's got that whole kind of, like, uh, walnut or, al- was it, al- yeah, walnut face. I don't know. But anyways, I'm not a fan of it, and I like the Jaws teeth. They have, like, a lot of the Shonen um, archetype face things, like the Jaws t- uh, teeth and stuff I don't really care for, but it's fine. It doesn't bug me too much, but I would have preferred it not to have ant faces, so that's probably the only negative I would probably give it, so... That's just nitpicking, though. I, I enjoyed it. Looking forward to the next season of it. And, um, yeah, that's that's that. Hopefully the whole, I guess, experiments with X did well for them. <laughs> and we'll see how it turns out. They always had, like, a, a I think only like a good hour before it actually dropped on Crunchy. Crunchyroll was doing a live stream, too. That's kind of weird, too. Um, as they were live streaming on Twitter, Crunchyroll was live streaming as well, which I think that's pretty much a one of their early examples of actually live streaming uh, an anime show on on Crunchyroll. I don't I can't think of any Seems of the ones. Seems like they did it once before, but I don't remember. They've done like regular live shows, but I'm not sure if they've ever done an anime live streamed. But they could have. But that was kind of interesting to see that as well. Anyways, Kaiju number 8, Kaiju number 8. All right, Chris, it's time for deliciousness. Deliciousness in dungeon. Let me just put dungeon meshy. I, I like how I can spell Dungeon Meshy better than Delicious Dungeon. <laughs> Such a weeb. I can spell a Japanese name better than an English name. Uh, yeah, Delicious in Dungeon. Where is where is my... See, I can spell Delicious. I'm not stupid. It's just hard when it's on another screen over to my right. Anyways, Delicious in Dungeon or Dungeon Meshy. Uh, this one should be on uh, Netflix. Ran for 24 episodes. Two core, finally completing uh, Done by Studio Trigger based on a manga. Adventure, comedy, fantasy... And, uh, yeah, this one opens up with, it opens up initially by explaining this dungeon where this, um, it was like a graveyard site or something like that. And suddenly this, this guy appeared from it. He's kind of decrepit. And he talked about how his kingdom was in trouble. This mad mage has taken over. And if anybody goes down there and stops the mad mage, they'll get everything. And then he disappears. And then cut forward. And now people are basically, this, this labyrinth was appeared underneath it. And so people go down into the labyrinth and go through all these layers to get further, further looking for the mad king to, or mad wizard, whatever, to take him out. And, uh, we follow Laos and his party and they go into the dungeon. They were fighting a dragon. And as they were about to lose, because they were really hungry, (laughs) their cleric fallen. She, as she's in the mouth of the dragon, teleports everybody out of the dungeon. And then it kind of, they have like a little dispute there. Some people kind of just, you know, leave um, we we were left with three characters, Laos, which is their tank or warrior. Uh, we have uh, Marsil, which is their caster mage, and Chilchuk, who is their um, their rogue, like the guy that checks for traps and stuff like that. Those are the three left, and they're like, what are we going to do? They still want to go back down there and help Fallon or save her, at least get her remains, because they're assuming that she's dead. <laughs> and Laos decides, you know, look, I'm going to go back down there. You guys don't have to come with me. And they're like, no, we're going to go with you. He's like, well, we're strapped for money, so... I was going to go by myself because I have this cookbook. And so to save money, because I don't, we don't have any money left, I'm going to cook the monsters of the dungeon as we go down. And, of course, Marcel's not too for it. Chilchuck's kind of a little off put by it, but they go. And so they travel down the dungeon, eating anything they can eat. They end up running into Senshi, who has been down there for a while. He's really good at cooking, so he's been helping them actually pretty much cook everything. So, yeah, and they just travel in there looking for trying to get down to the dragon again so they can save Fallen and get her remains and uh, all on the way running into different colorful individuals. So your thoughts, your review of tw- the, the the two core series, Delicious Dungeon. Well, he's got another season, I think. Yeah, it seemed like they they were saying to be continued. It's kind of needed because 
Didn't, yeah. didn't really feel done. No, it, it, that was a bad, but horrible ending. But then it's like, that's going to be probably be like the, the carrot on the stick for the rest of it. Or, yeah, like the, the bait for the rest of the entire series, I would imagine. I honestly, um, the this show looked fantastic. I, I thought it looked great through and through. Um, loved the concept. It was an absolute just goof fest all the way through. Goof just, fest. Yeah, it, it, it's just constantly dragging dragging out of food dragging. randomly shinchi just I, let's let's cook something and he's he's randomly starts making some random food out of whatever the heck they they just killed um the main storyline this i liked it it was intriguing enough um it gave everybody their reasons for doing things i I, I I hate to say that I, I I just I think that I got to a point where I wanted it to move faster. I, I it felt like it just kind of drug out, especially when they got to the dragon. Now to um, be clear, Chris, you binged it. How far? How much of it did you have to binge? Because I'm because this is probably going to be one of those interesting things of like binge versus not binge. Because I never felt like it dragged, but I was watching it weekly. Except for one segment. I did like a five episode span like in a blitz. But for the rest of that, I watched weekly basically. So I'm curious how much of it you had to actually binge and that was the reason why. Maybe it's just one of those shows that kind of that, uh, that, only that feels be. like it drags because you had to binge it. Um, I did pretty much three or four binge sessions. So... Mm. <sighs> Because there was the the first few that I had binged to get, to get caught up to it, and then towards the end of the season, I uh, or the the first core, I kind of binged a batch to get that. Um. So maybe three three binge sessions. This last one was probably the worst. So, yes, maybe I guess, but it seems like I. Uh, now I will admit I I agree with you when it comes to I think the carrot on the stick, like I said, with Fallen. I think that that whole thing is like, I don't know that, I don't know that this is something they can just keep doing because they, what they basically do is early on, they start, as they're going through the dungeon early on, they keep, like a lot of things seems to refer, reference to Fallen. Again, mm -hmm. Fallen being their cleric. This is the sister of Laos. She is somebody that seemingly everybody adored. She was so great. She's very kind hearted. She's very skilled. Um, she could do like some really great. I mean, she was like a prodigy when she was younger. Like she was, she was spotting like ghosts and stuff like that, and that kind of isolated her. And this is a reason why Laos didn't really much so much like his homeland. But like it seems like so many people are very much connected, especially Marcel. They're all connected to her strongly, and so it kind of keeps referencing back to her, and they keep telling these, you know, random tales about their time with her. And then it turns into this whole thing where it's like we badly need to get to her. We need to get to her, and then it, and then it. And it has a brief moment where it's like, oh, they finally got her. And it's like, nope, they're not. And it keeps it keeps doing that carrot on a stick for it. And I'm like, I don't know how I went to cores with this as a carrot on a stick because I, there's times where I'm like, this is kind of going to get, it's going to get old. But at the same time, I kind of understand it as being kind of a driving force. There is an overall plot and that is who will find the Mad King or Mad Mage and stop the Mad Mage and, you know, take over the, the kingdom. Right. But and then you got the the elves getting involved now, and that's that's the part of the whole thing of like, yeah, you better announce another season because out of nowhere at the very end they're like, oh crap, hitting the fan. They got the elves showing up. They're mad. They're gonna go down there and to get this thing. <laughs> it's like all this crazy stuff's happening. They're talking about how like they've gone into these dungeons before and and basically destroy the dungeon so that the monsters come out of the dungeon and actually attack the people on the the surface. And many people died. And it's like, oh, we're introducing this now. Like we're we're about to wrap up the season. You're introducing this stuff now, so yeah. Th there's a lot of threads to the. I'm I'm surprised how many threads are in this story, because yeah, I, and I think initially, and this gets in more in my review. Um, so I hope you're done, or you can just jump in later on. Um, <laughs> the, the the interesting thing about this show is like the title, Dungeon Meshy, Delicious and Dungeon, Eating Dungeon, whatever you want to call it. The concept here is eating monsters. That's that's the bread and butter, pun intended. That is the concept here. And so you're thinking, me, I was thinking, I'm like, okay, 
The trailers look really good. You got some crazy cool trigger action scenes. The characters run away from fl explosions, and it looks you know super fun. The character designs are very unique and very fun as well. So I'm like, okay, maybe it might be a fun fantasy show because I hate food shows. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we'll see. I'm getting into it. I'm like, okay, this is good. This is good. This is really good. I'm actually liking this. And then at some point, I'm like, okay, this has got way too much story. <laughs> this has got, like, what? Like, I think I said it in my first impressions, and I think I may have said it in our mid-season. I don't know if we did it. But um, at some point, I'm like, it might have been my video that I did on the, was it the 18th episode? It's crazy episode. 17th. The Chimera. Yeah. Um, At some point, I mentioned the idea that, like, if this show took the food out of it, it would be probably my favorite fantasy show. Like, besides, I don't know, it would, it would have to fight with, uh, it would have to fight with Raren. But it would be, like, literally my my favorite fantasy show of all time because the fantasy of this show is so good. Like, this is a labyrinth, dungeon diving, uh, JRPG dungeon diving type of story that just all well, it feels it, like it's alive and it's breathing and it's so well thought out. And the characters are great and the story is actually really good and the character plot lines are really good. And it's like, you just take out the food thing, and I'm gonna be I'm sold on this being a perfect show for me. Well, and and one of the things that's kind of cool about that is the idea that they take the time to think out the things that um, makes everything work. Um, I mean, yeah, they put a food twist on it, um, but they're they're it seems like they're actually trying to do what, what it is that we've, we've kind of, I've kind of implied that I would really love to have a, not, not a fourth wall breaking, but kind of a fourth wall breaking, explaining the, the mechanics behind uh, different RPG tropes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of glomp on a lot of those goofy shows that try to do that. Um, usually they're parodies. Glomp? Yes. I said glomp. <laughs> um, uh, I I I love the idea of them actually trying to do that and make it fun and actually interesting to do that. And this is one of those that has actually kind of pulled it off. I mean, yeah, the weirdest thing about the JRPG tropes and whatnot is the dying. Because I there's a side of me that's like this this old this actually makes it feel like I can't take any scenes seriously because again, like with the seventeenth or whatever the Chimera episode, it was like. People are getting wrecked. Mm -hmm. People are getting slaughtered. But I'm like, at the same time, I'm like, but they're also cracking jokes. Why? It never ha it, it never gets too serious. Even though I think, especially with the whole Chim Chimera thing, it's extremely serious. And I think it's kind of heartbreaking in a lot of regards. But like, there's just always this element of they are still making jokes amidst this. Why? Oh, I keep having to remind myself because they have no real concept of death in this dungeon. Like, it, you you literally just have to take the per now. The fear is, is that you never get rescued. Mm -hmm. Your body sits there because they talk about this idea of like the egg and your souls inside the egg. And just as long as you don't break that open and take the 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 yolk out, you can be revived. And so the idea here is if they find somebody that's dead, they will. They will typically like string them up or something like that so somebody else can find them. And when they're going on the way back up the surface, they'll take the body up the top. And they'll bring it to this counter and they'll revive them. And so like – and yes, and you have a lot of characters that can – like Fallen can – I think Fallen could uh, revive. You have people that can actually revive like you know healers and whatnot that as they're in the dungeon, they'll heal. And yeah, there's like – sometimes there's like this expectation to pay somebody for a revive or whatever because they have to go out of their way to help you out. Um Again, the idea of somebody dying just doesn't seem to click in their mind because – and this is strictly in the dungeon, by the way. And There's something about the, the dungeon itself that if you die in there, your body gets trapped to your, – your your soul gets trapped to your body and you could be revived. Uh, this is not something that can happen outside. Like when they go to leave and portal out, they'll say check yourself because once we leave the dungeon, if you die on the other side of this portal – you're on the surface, you'll die. So it's again, it's like it, it almost seems like it warps the minds of these people. Like they'll run into like a random plant that just spews out a corpse and they're just like, they they shrug. Okay, let's string it up so that somebody that's walking by can pick it up and take it back to the surface. It just, it feels so, it feels so off, but I'm so mixed on it because I keep having to remind myself. And so whenever there is a very serious moment, I'm like, why are they cracking jokes? This seems like, it, oh, that's right, because death isn't really a thing down here <laughs> like it, my i constantly struggled with it i'm not sure if it's something that even came to your mind or if it bothered you at all but i almost felt like no. the comedy almost 
in serious moments was like, and again, it was it was a lot to do with that chimera moment. Like it felt like, why are they cracking jokes right now? This is really like this seems big. Like this seems real big. <laughs> of course, Lyle's response to initially when they first showed that it was like weird, and then the chimera comes down and literally this chick's telling her boss to go away uh, to, to run or whatever, and literally gets cut off mid-sentence as she's crushed under the foot on the ground. There's a splatter of blood, and I'm like, that was that was really shocking, but they're still cracking jokes. Okay, I, I, I don't know what to think right now. <laughs> Your friend just got splattered, and you're cracking jokes. Uh, it's weird. It, it, it feels weird. Anyways, um, that's a long blab there. But no, like I said, I will admit, um, I'm going to be perfectly, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to admit to everybody I skip forward every now and then whenever there was food on the screen. Mm. I can't stand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, if I wanted to get through this show, I was going to have to, not big skips. We're talking, like, little, like, five-second jumps just to kind of nudge it forward, make sure nothing happens in the, the cooking scene. It never does. I have to. Like, I just, I only did a couple times, honestly. Um, it just, I can't stand it. I, I, that's the, that's where I get bored because it, the initial cooking in the process, I think is sometimes interesting because like, like I got a kick out of the, how they had Chilchuck or, uh, Senshi had Chilchuck figure out where this one trap was so they can produce the heat that this flame from this trap to cook the oil. And so it had like a clever dungeon thing to it. I mean, it always has a dungeon thing to it, but it's typically just the actual creature. But whenever it had, like, a, a an interesting thing to the cooking process, I found it interesting. Like, cooking with the orcs or ogres or whatever, that I still watch because it actually has a story element to it. But when it was just simply, hey, I'm actually hungry. Oh, well, we have some plants over here. Let's We have some leftovers from previous one. Let's cook it up. Chop this up. And you stick it in here. You put it inside the pot. You make sure to increase the heat. You throw the thing on top of it. You wait 30 minutes. And voila. Da -da -da -da. Here's the name of it. Are you sure I'm never going to cook that because I have no clue what those ingredients are because it's literally fan fantasy? I think, well, I think that most <laughs> of them I don't care were. to sit here and listen to it. I think it's, most of them playoffs were. of real food. Yeah, I think but. they were mostly. Well, one of the things that I thought was the coolest in, in particular was the mimics and the um, yeah, it was the, the uh, living armors. How I do you those cook were, a living armor? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the ones so, that were the and coolest. It's always to me. the thing that they do. They do where where Laos is talking about. Man, it would be really interesting if I ever try to cook this thing. Like the magic armor was that case. I wonder if you can eat a magic armor. Hmm, how would that work? They run into magic armors, and sure enough, they find out how to cook the magic armors. It, it's always like he. They literally like flag every mill. Well, not every mill, but they flag a lot of the mills because it's always just like, I wonder what this would taste like, and then it actually appeared before them. Like Turn, I said, turning ghosts into into shaved ice, or was it I actual ice cream? I want to say it was shaved ice. It was shaved ice, yeah. But again, I, I it didn't ruin the show for me. I, I I think it was it was it wasn't as prevalent as I thought it was going to be. And I think there was plenty of the dungeons and the world and the mechanics and the characters and the history of the characters. And again, that carrot on the stick that I think is just I love but hate having there. <laughs> Um, everything around Fallen was fantastic, and, and that might and that might have been my, my main reason was, and I just put it in the in a different different category as the issue, um, because I, I mean it's it's pretty much if you think about it, it's the same problem is is the Fallen issue. Um, when we get to the Chimera, it's almost like it kind of pushed it back a bit, and so while I was still frustrated with that entire issue that was kind of the problem is that it it seemed like all of that was kind of dragging out yeah yeah no. i um i did appreciate i i think my favorite character of the show definitely is marcel and it, oh and marcel me, was awesome let me be perfectly clear early on it was because i liked marcel as her character design was fantastic her say you was fantastic she was the Yes, she, she was often just the goofball. She was the overreacting, like, we're going to cook this, and she freaks out and she screams about it, which I did, honestly, early on. I was like, this this, this actually could get old. Like, her overly reacting to every food was going to look, gonna get old eventually because she's liking everything she eats, but, yes, she keeps saying how she does not want to eat things. Um, but, no, I, I fell in love with her character. Like, her whole backstory, um, which, again, a lot of it ties in with Fallen, um, how all that stuff tied in and yes getting into what thing that she knows how to do 
which is extremely like a uh, question mark and how other people perceive what she's able to actually do getting into yes the conundrum that she has towards the later parts of like did i actually cause this and how people blame her for causing something that could that could literally land her in a really bad spot like all that stuff was really good getting in her the whole nightmare thing was super cool as well i just loved every little detail they got into with her character i thought i thought she was fantastic in that regard so um yeah i, I think overall like i said really really enjoy this show if you took out the cooking literally it's a perfect show it's a it's literally a perfect show for me if you took out the cooking so yeah i will admit there's like there was probably of the 24 episodes i would probably say there's maybe three episodes that weren't really really good but the rest of them are really, I, they were just fantastic so especially like i said the the chimera episode that literally goes down as like one of the one of the best episodes ever like it was it was enough that literally i wasn't watching uh dungeon meshing weekly and then when I seen, like, hints at what happened in that episode, I immediately stopped everything to binge. I think it was behind, like, six episodes. Binge six episodes, watch that episode, and it, it was like, holy crap, that was the music, the animation, the emotion, um, the vocals in the music. It was just, like, again, like, the, the brutality of it. It was just like, this is not Dungeon Meshi. This can't be Dungeon Meshi. What the hell is this? The visual, the chimera and how just majestic and beautiful but brutal it looked it was like holy crap this is so freaking good um easily one of the best scenes of this uh, this uh this year i would be, it'd be hard pressed to find another show that had like that incredible of an episode so did you like that episode it was pretty good it was pretty I, good. I thought it i thought it i thought <laughs> it was pretty good. it was really well directed that's for oh fact. yeah oh yeah like that later part where it screams and just like they get on the shield and there's just spikes flying everywhere and then it climbs up that wall like it just looks so good it looks so good <laughs> anyways yeah the, like the little the little gin comes floating up she's like what the heck is that <laughs> it was like cool anyways i can gush about that forever but yeah anyways that's that's delicious in dungeon anything else mm -mm. i literally wrote there 17 chimera <laughs> and you still ask what which i was like 18 was it 18 you're like it's 17 do you see a 17 right there no, I actually just so you just off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just remembered that that was the episode that you wanted uh, me to watch. I was telling you, like, man, did you see that episode? Oh my gosh! And I made the, no. I think it was on the video. You're like, yeah, I seen your video where you went crazy on it. All right, let's get to the train. Let's get on the train to the end of the world, or Shimatsu Train Doko e Iku. This one streamed on Crunchyroll for twelve episodes. EMT squared. I don't know why for the entire season I thought this on high dive. I don't know what is about this show that I'm like, it's got to be on High Dive, right? Because no, I think it's because nobody talks about this show. And it's like, why isn't this more popular? Oh, it must be on High Dive. No, it's on Crunchyroll. That can't be the excuse. I wanted to use the it's on High Dive excuse. Uh, but anyways, yeah, it's on Crunchyroll. Uh, done by EMT Squared. It's an original. It's an adventure. But um, yeah, series composition and script was done by Miko, uh, Michiko Yokote, who has done a lot of incredible stuff, including like Surune, Onimai, uh, Genshiken, Gintama... Uh, Bleach, Naruto. She's been everywhere. She even worked with uh, with them on Cowboy Bebop. She's, this is definitely, I think that was one of the reasons why I wanted this to do so well. And when it was doing well, I'm like, this needs more attention because I kind of like, one, an original that's actually really good. But two, this is, I was hoping that this could be like Michiko Yukote's like big breakout. So anyways, uh, yeah, this one takes place in Japan. At some point, this one girl, Yoka, she is traveling to uh, Ikebukuro. And when she arrives there, she is immediately addressed as being like the, I forget what it was, like 7,777, 7,100, th it's a bunch of sevens, uh, a visitor of the place. So they're going to bring, they literally have a drone pick her up and take her to the top of this building where they have her press the button to launch their new 7G technology. Like we're, we're going to go straight to this new technology is going to allow people to send communication from brain to brain. Like, no need of a cell phone. That's how high-tech this stuff is. Um, but yeah, they have her press it, and it completely warps everything around them. Um, she immediately presses it again. It doesn't really mess... It doesn't really help. But yeah, everything gets completely warped. Then we cut over to Agano. And at Agano, we have the people there. We find out, basically, over time that every single town is affected in a different way. For Agano specifically, everybody, when they reach the age, I think it was like 23, 
they transform into an animal. Anybody below age 23, they're still human. And so we follow um, four girls who are living in Nagano, and they're just kind of going about their daily routine. Every now and then, this one truck will show up to bring them uh, resources. And yeah, we find out that this, basically everything that's on this train line to Ikebukuro, all those towns are still there. But at some point, we find out that it seems like everything beyond that's not on that train line is gone. And the distance between each train station is, like, increased. So it's, it's definitely warped the world in a lot of ways. But, yeah. At some point, uh, one of the, uh, the, the supply trucks gets there. They look at this article, and they find out Yoka, who was actually from this town, um, who pressed the button, she is still in a kubukuro. She was in a, a newspaper uh, article. So Suzuru feeling regretful of the fact that she said something mean to her when they were younger, and that's the reason why Yoka left, uh, decides to hijack a train and go to Ikebukuro to to find her friend Yoka. Um, but yeah, there's this other kind of side plot is this guy, Zenjiro, that's old, that hasn't been transformed into an animal. Uh, he ends up telling uh, the main character, Shizuru, that um, there's this bad guy that is up in Ikebukuro, and he was trying to stop him from launching the 7G because he knew it was going to cause a problem. And so... They might be able to help pun, them pun, stop pun, it. Pun, pun. Yeah, two, 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 two guy. Yeah, that guy. But yeah, uh, they travel. Uh, well, Suzu goes to travel on with this train, and her friends Nadeshko, Akira, and Remy join her, and they go to each station and run into crazy things that happen at each of the towns. So, like I said, every town seems to be affected in different ways by the Seven G. So you'll have one town where. One town, everybody turned to zombies. This other town, everybody has mushrooms on their body, and the mushrooms make them feel good, but then they die eventually, um, but they seem to be okay with it. Um, every single town has something different, unique about them that they discover. So one town, one station, they just basically, they didn't even stop <laughs> because anybody there just gets racked with insane itching sensations. <laughs> one, like, makes them recall, like, past trauma uh, they're they're all weird in some way. One was like the entire town is like insanely small. So these girls are walking around the city and they're like still like normal size, but they look like kaiju basically. Um, it's that that's kind of the shtick there. So, but yeah, my my thoughts on train the end of the world. Uh, did you want to go first? How far did you say you got? You got to the zombie, didn't? At least you. Yeah, right? I got through the zombies. I yeah. I got to the edge of Ikeburo. Iki. Yeah, Ikebukuro. That's why I split it up on my screen. For some reason, Ikebukuro, I have I, a problem. For whatever saying. reason, it just. <laughs> it's just so... I, I've been. I, I, I was. It was sounding right in my head, but the second I tr tried to speak it, um, it didn't. It didn't quite get it. Get it to that point for me that it did for you. I, I, I liked it just fine. Um, he doesn't like Yaru's. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's or was it Pochi? My, you don't like, you my don't hatred, like Pochi. my hatred of Gyaru. You hate Pochi. Um, That's what it is. Pochi is like freaking awesome. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I if anybody dude, doesn't like dude, Pochi, you Pochi have a wrecked some zombies, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Pochi was like wrecking things. No, what it was like was that they, they waited too long to get Kuroki in, and then they cut her out too early so that that that's the big you know, what's problem the sad thing is you missed her returning oh mm, that's i was so freaking happy when she showed back up I'm like yes a croaky yes <laughs> yeah i for those who don't know uh, the the zombie episode i guess you could pluralize it because there's like a this i think like the second half of the previous episode is is croaky as well the zombies the zombie segment of this show I was mentioning earlier with the whole Chimera being the, the best episode. That was actually the best episode. The zombie episodes of Train of the Inner World was easily, like, the best stuff I've ever I've watched recently. Um, no, I'm, over, I'm overselling it, obviously. I don't think it's, like, incredible stuff here. But I just liked it. Like, there was so much about it that you can just... It was so simple in concept. It's girl that that runs... ends up. She was in the wrong town, and she ends up running into a bunch of zombies in the zombie town. And then they... You come to find out that whenever the zombies see something that stimulates them, which in this case was she came out of the bathroom and her skirt was caught up. And so they seen her ponsu and they blew up. And so she realized that she can kill the zombies by showing them her ponsu. And so she threatens the, the zombies for a little bit with her ponsu and then she ends up running away. But then she comes back and then she's, the, the zombies like decide to make her like the queen. And so they follow her around. And I was like, it almost feels like an idol thing. Like they're all meant, they're they're worshiping her like an idol, and 
like I was joking about with my video, you can even stretch that further in the idea of like the whole concept of the unspoken rule amongst the idol fans that you don't you don't touch the idol and you don't see more than you should see. And if you see more than you should see, you're you're dead. And so that's them popping. But yeah, I, I thought it was a really cool episode that you can totally dig into and get into like the fact that she was bullied and that's why she was in the town and uh, the possibility that her the town that she was from that she tried to go to is gone now and everything around that stuff. I thought it was super interesting. Um, where was I going with this? Um, but yeah, I was like super happy when she showed back up later on. I thought it was an incredible episode. Super good stuff. Now, I will admit that I don't think really much else comes to that level. Like, I, I, I kind of enjoyed the, the small town segment. Um, I liked pretty much all the early episodes. I, 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 my biggest issue that I have with the show is, and I was expecting this. I was thoroughly expecting this. The ending sucks. <laughs> like, besides Kuroki showing back up, which I thought was incredible, the ending just was kind of like, so that's why they're doing this? Like, I I was fully expecting there not to be some interesting end to it. And I really did feel like I was I was dreading them actually getting to Yoka because they kind of deem her as being the queen because she's the one that pressed the button. So they're deeming her a queen, and they start showing why she was in Kubukuro, and it was because... Shizuru, Shizuru said something really stupid. Like, Shizuru said something really stupid. Yoka's saying that she wanted to become an astronaut, and Yo Shizuru's obviously not wanting her to leave the town. Said some really nasty stuff. Y oh, you, you're not going to become an astronaut, right? He, that's that's for special people, not for people like us. She was downplaying her because she she kind of didn't want... It seemingly didn't want Yoka to leave. But yeah, it was, she said something stupid, and Yoka leaves. And then... I'm like, oh, please don't turn to some stupid thing where she's trying to tell her she's sorry and that turns into like this world ending apocalypse as if she can apologize properly to this girl. It just turned into, it It just wasn't that interesting. The ending wasn't that interesting at all. So that's my only hang up. But more so on the idea that besides Kuroki showing back up with the zombies, which was fantastic, like everything after I would probably say, since the point that they opened up the Magic Girl, Girl episode, from that from that opening, which I thought was funny because they went through these pages of this manga to show like these synopsis of all these different characters of it, and they were so messed up. Like the the girl that could not live wasn't comfortable unless she had a noose around her neck. Yeah, <laughs> it was like what is what these characters are so like so messed up. Uh, these are magical girl characters, and yeah, they have like the character that was like. Uh, I don't even know if I could say it on YouTube. There's like this medicine that he uh, gets off uh, that gets knocked off of him whenever he gets hit. That makes people super happy, or whatever. Um, but anyways, ever since that intro, that episode, the actual Magical Girl World episode, and like the whole Shogi stuff they did, and then everything beyond then was like, I, I want to say there's some other segment between there and the ending that I liked, but it was like it went downhill from there. Like everything after that went downhill. Um, but everything well, they went through the super good. They went through the um, what's the giant, the magical girl, and then they uh, immediately was it the the giant? I don't Maybe think that was. So. I want to say that it. No, was. it was because that was not, when they because they had to go there, and then that's when he told them uh, that how to get into the next place because in the next place, um, it was cut off, and then they did yeah, the, then the hats. Started helping them out. Yeah, they had the hats. Makoto. Yeah, she was the yeah because she was in the small small town. She and, knew she knew Zenjiro. Um, and then and then that's See, the, that's how she they found out the, how to get into the Ikebukuro. Yeah, because like ever since the Shogi part, that's when um they started talking about how they were gonna stop them because they were told to stop these girls from getting there because anybody that knows Yoka, they don't want anybody going there because they'll they'll mess with Yoka. But anyways, um. It's just the shogi part and the very final segment. I'll just say for sure those parts. I just was like, whatever. Let's just get past this, concluded or whatever. But everything else I loved. Like everything leading up to that stuff, I just absolutely loved. I thought every little world I went to was super fascinating. Like the whole shroom thing and getting into that whole concept there. Every character kind of getting a moment. The only thing in between that I didn't really care much for is when they're not like exploring the individual towns and the oddities that were within each town, because that's kind of the concept you get here. It's like a Kino's journey thing where it's like going to the next town and what's weird about this town and kind of observing it from the outside and kind of going, okay, that's kind of weird or that's kind of wrong or, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of unsettling. And they'll go to the next place. In between there is 
not very good dialogue. Like, I just, I didn't really care much for the banter between the characters. I was talking early on when I did my first impressions that it almost felt like these characters were almost in a, uh, what, what's the what's the term in Japanese? It's a manzai? It's like a, it's a comedy routine in Japan where you have like two individuals and they're talking back and forth and they'll do like the whole, oh, this, 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 this. And this person responds to it, this, 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 this. And they keep kind of playing off each other until one of them slaps the other one in the chest. It's, it's kind of that whole comedy bit routine between two characters that it seemed like this was going with because you would have a character bring up something like early on. A good example early on was uh, Shizuru uh, basically was going to go on her own, but the other girls joined her. And at some point they're like, we're hungry. Well, I have some food in my bag. And then they go to look in the bag and then suddenly they make this long, this long dialogue about the food in the bag. And it's like, what is this conversation? Please have substance to what you're talking about. Now, sometimes they'll mix things in there. And that's why I had to pay attention. Like I would, I would love to just skip through it because some of the dialogue, I'm like, this is such a stupid conversation. And it would be bickering constantly, especially between Akira and Remy. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm please resolve this soon because your bickering back and forth is obnoxious. It was this constant bickering and the characters, the, what they're talking about wasn't interesting, but I had to pay attention because every now and then they would kind of reference another town or some oddity about a town. And I think that there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's mixed in there to give you an idea of the overall effects of the world itself. Like I said earlier, the idea of people turning into animals at some point at this other town, they get into the idea that, yes, after time, they're afraid that they're going to lose themselves because, like, the early on was, like, the whole thing with the, the bear nearly attacking Nadeshko. Um, this idea of, at some point, not only do they get turned into animals, they retain themselves, but at some point they're going to become the animals 100%. They're going to lose their their human identity and they're going to lose their minds to primal instincts or whatever. So I still had to pay attention <laughs> despite the fact that a lot of the dialogue wasn't great. Now, I will say after probably like the fourth or fifth episode, it felt like the dialogue got better. So I didn't I didn't it didn't frustrate me as much. So I didn't I didn't think that they were they had any chemistry at all. So take that for what it is. That's my opinion on that. Childhood friends who doesn't seem like they're childhood friends. <laughs> yeah. Now, when I got into Remy and Akita's story, I was like, okay, that's kind of sweet. But still, it's like, God dang, you guys just kill each other already or kick one of them out of the train. <laughs> it's like, you guys can't be fighting for the entire train trip. I'm going to be losing my mind listening to you guys. I, I, I will say, despite my my frustrations with the, the, the final climax and the final town they get to and the, the final battle, whatever in the final boss, I will say that I'm kind of, I kind of give them mad respects for how they concluded things because I had, I had my mindset on how it was going to resolve, like, you know, press the button and undo everything. Right. Or something like that. Yeah. No. But they actually, they actually had a, I would, I wouldn't say bitter sweet. It would be like, that's just how it is kind of ending. I, w I did kind of respect it for its ending in that regard. So Kind of surprising. Not surprising. Anyways, that's, that's Train of the End of the World. It looked good, too. There was, like, a lot of people talking about, like, in the fourth episode, some director made a comment or somebody made a comment about some backgrounds kind of uh, being delayed to delivery or something like that. And everybody started panicking, saying, oh, my gosh, they're going to have production delays. They're sending the backgrounds now. And I'm like, probably just somebody goofed up. It's probably their way ahead of it at this point. They only had one episode where they delayed. It was like um, they did like a 11.5 episode or something like that. But that could have been planned. So I think they did a good job despite everybody trying to doomer it. It looked it looked really good the entire way. It was like a couple of uh, myth spots, but train the end of the world. That's that. All right, Chris, it's your turn. Is it? It's time for you to tell everybody why the hell did you watch Banished former hero <laughs> okay i guess i'll open it up for you <laughs> i guess i could open it up for you the vanished former hero lives as he pleases or deki sokonai to yobanata moto eiyu wa jika kara sui ho sarata no de suki kata ni uh oh so there's more <laughs> there's another line <laughs> ikuro uh koto ni shita uh, anyways, yeah, this one, man, if I can remember correctly, 
This one opens up with a hero of a world, and he's dying. And I think he asked, like, to be reincarnated or, or, or grant a wish. But anyways, uh, this hero dies and then reincarnates into another world where he is the son of a noble. Uh, they're seen as not having any potential in magic, so they kind of, they treat him terribly. And at some point, when he gets a certain age, the, the dad's like, you're a disgrace, get out of here. And he's like, oh okay, yes, I got you. And then when he leaves the door, he's like, yes, thank you. Now I can live a peaceful life where I don't have any responsibilities or expectations of me. They, I think they did... Was this the one where they got into the idea that he was a hero in the previous world and people, yeah. like, shunned him because they were scared of him or whatever? Yes. Yeah, so he's he wants to he wants to lay low. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get involved with anything. Yeah, that was a joke that I had with his first impression, so I'm going to tell the same joke. He wanted to lay low and not get involved with anything with his super OP powers. Uh, because everybody shunned him in his previous world for being a hero. But then he immediately sees the princess of the kingdom traveling with only one knight who sucks at fighting dogs. And he saves them from the attack of the dogs. And then uses healing to save the life of Beatrice, the guard the guard of the princess. And then uses healing magic to heal their carriage. But he doesn't, he wants to lay low. So he only uses his godlike powers to save the princess. But then they go off and he helps them with like well, he she's was, supposed he was, to go. He was gonna he, he was betrothed to her, so Yeah, yeah, you go. And she was like the only one that was nice to him when he was in the parties or whatever, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, if I remember correctly. But yeah, uh the princess like got this like calling to go help this thing, like a prophecy. So she's not really sure what it is, but she had to go to this place. Ends up being a hero. The hero of the world is apparently trying to kill a dragon. So Alan, the main character, wanting to lay low, decides to help them kill a dragon. But he's laying low. He doesn't want to take any attention upon himself. Right. But then, yeah, then the princess offers to have him go to a blacksmith to get a weapon, I think. And so to be to lay low, he goes to this, this blacksmith to get a, an overpowered weapon made. But he's laying low. And then he stops an assassination attempt in the blacksmith. Because it seems like everybody he goes to, an assassination attempt is being done on those people. Mm -hmm. I've, apparently everybody. Like the, he, the princess, it was an assassination attempt. He stops it. The the hero, it was assassination attempt. Apparently, he stopped it. The blacksmith, apparently, they want the blacksmith dead, too. So he stopped that assassination attempt. Everywhere he goes, his dad and this weird top hat guy is trying to kill everybody that he goes to. Anyways, that, that's about as far as I got before I said I cannot stand this show anymore. I got to stop watching this. So tell us, Chris. Henrietta. Why uh, the hell did you they, keep watching this show? They were trying to kill Henrietta, too. No way. Yeah. Well, the assassin, when I think he stopped the assassin, they wanted the assassin dead too, right? If I remember correctly, they wanted to kill her too. So even the assassin, well, they weren't assassinated. Probably. Yeah. I bet Nadia, the cute dog lady, she was going to get killed too. I bet you his dad was going to get assassinated at some point. No, his dad was doing the assassinating. Well, I know, but you, you, he was working for somebody. And so they probably came after him at some point. Or the, um, the brother. The brother the got brother, assassinated. The, the brother, yeah. <laughs> Who was the one that sent the dogs after the princess to help dad assassinate that? Anyways. Now what, everybody, now everybody's commenting down below that we didn't the watch the show. The <laughs> you two times speed watcher. Uh, the banished former hero lives by saving assassination or saving people from assassination attempts while laying low mm. and enjoying his new life. He so low he goes underground. So he's basically just going to live the same life as he did last time. Yeah. Except this world, nobody's afraid of him. Mm -hmm. They like him. That's different. Why'd you watch this show? Why is it on the screen right now? Why do we have to talk about this? Why is this taking a time slot in our review podcast? Because Why you, did you not because watch you, Because you needed better? something to, to fill the time slot so that I'm actually saying something. So I don't have to talk for the entire podcast, exactly. which I'm doing right now? Um, and people are yelling in the comments, this, did you talk too much? <laughs> this isn't one of my favorite shows, but it is fine. I, I, I liked it enough to just keep on watching it. It as a popcorn show um the girls are cute alan is when I'm generally model. cool i guess <laughs> i i i'm i don't i don't i don't care much for the 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 as andrew says woo 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 guys i and he's pretty much one of those <laughs> um as, as andrew calls them woo 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 guys the woo 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 guys um, quote unquote woo 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 guys <laughs> but no the I I Alan aside as far as the story is concerned I I didn't get enough as far as 
meat is concerned for this show. I, I really wanted to dig into something involved in this. And the biggest reveal that they had was one of the characters that he ends up meeting at some point is the actual angel from the previous life that no he way. saved the world no. for. And no, she's, they did not. She's trying to join the harem. Wow. And that I thought was kind of a cool little thing that they did. But you didn't see that, didn't was, see that one coming. No, I didn't that see that one coming at all. Okay, that would. Whoosh. But. As far as anything else, it it really was all surface level. I didn't feel like there was any depth to any of the writing. So, it, honestly, this was kind of in the middle of the pack, if not in the lower lower level part of the the pack. All all said and done, it's just a popcorn show, really is. I and and so you if, were able to keep the popcorn down as you're watching the show. Yeah. You didn't puke. Mm -mm. I mean, studio. Dean, come on, dude. They butcher that show. Mm. Characters look bad. <laughs> the character looks bad. You know, people are going to see it. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see those screenshots I took. They look bad. <laughs> uh, like that one shot next to the carriage. It's like, oh, what is this? Like, this is one of those shows where I try to I try to find good screenshots. And it's like, I can't find a good screenshot of this show. <laughs> it looks bad. Anyways, is that it? That's it. There you go. Banish former hero. Let's get into something good. Uh, salad Bowl of Eccentrics, or Henjin no Salad Bowl. This one's straight on Crunchyroll for 12 episodes, done by Synergy SP and Studio Comet, based on a light novel. Uh, character designs by Kantaku, Andrew's favorite, uh, well, second favorite character designer. So, But anyways, yeah, this one opens up with uh, Sosuke, and Sosuke is a detective. He's a self-employed detective. He's just doing, like, typically, like, these mostly most cases it's like somebody's trying to dig up some some proof that their husband or wife is cheating on them so they can take them to court and divorce or whatever but um yeah on the on the at the same time we get a brief perspective of a different world where this Sarah da Odin she is currently fleeing from her her home and these people are chasing them down like their their kingdom is being overthrown and so she's fleeing with her knight, and at some point she goes into this one cave where she's pretty sure there, there's this portal to another dimension that she can jump into. Sure enough, it's there. She jumps into the portal and ends up dropping right on top of Sosuke as he's walking down the street. Uh, very quickly, he's like, oh, that hurt. And she's like, oh, here, let me see your hand. And she heals it. So he's like, okay, very quickly he can establish this girl is not of this world, or at least knows that she has some weird ability. Um, but she helps him prove even more by explaining that she's from another world and using her magic to blow up this, like toy set in this um the jungle gym or whatever inside this playground before they have to flee the area but yeah he ends up taking her back to his place where he's like okay you can stay here for the night but you need you need to go find some like place to go or your parents or whatever and she's like okay that's fine but tomorrow morning i'm gonna have to erase your memory because I, I can't have anybody finding out that i'm in this world otherwise you know the government will come and take me and dissect me or whatever so i'm gonna have to clear your mind oh you can do that I haven't really done it before, and it kind of, it could mess you up. And he's like, okay, that's fine. You can stay here as long as you need to. <laughs> he's like, don't mess, don't fry my brains. Uh, but yeah, it kind of just from this point on, just the shenanigans of Sosuke, who is like this 20-something-year-old uh, detective taking all these jobs. At the same time, he's got living with him. Uh, they find out at some point she's like 12. This 12-year-old that is uh, from a fantasy world that has like super fantasy powers and shenanigans unfolds. There is a subplot here. Um, there's several subplots around here. One, yes, her uh, guard, from her knight from the previous world, she jumped in the portal too, so she's trying to find the princess. And at the same time, living homelessly, and there's this random homeless guy, Suzuki, who is, like, helping her figure out, like, okay, yeah, you go over here, and they, they have, like, food trucks over here. She joined a cult. Yeah, at some point, she gets pulled into a cult, uh, gambling rings, uh, uh, this this hostess club with questionable activities happening in it like she gets dragged into everything um while her knight's getting dragged into whatever scams or whatever that she can get into eventually becoming like this <laughs> pretty much the cult leader itself <laughs> or at least the cult leader falls in love with her um at while that shenanigans happening most of the stuff around sosuke and sarah is yes the comedy is around the idea of him doing a job and she'll help using her magic but a lot of it is kind of surprisingly wholesome in the idea that it is almost 
yes, getting into why Sosuke himself isn't looking for love, and that's a lot to do with the fact that he has seen so much divorce and whatnot that he has lost, <laughs> like, hope and humanity and, and love. At the same time, yeah, it's, like, slowly developing this relationship between Sosuke and Sarah as kind of like a father-daughter thing. Even at some point, getting to the point where it's like, hey, do you want me to adopt you? Do you want to become my real daughter? Um, it's really sweet in that regard. I thought I was actually very surprised how extremely wholesome the show is kind of sprinkled within all the other shenanigans that's happening. But yeah, I I will say this is kind of one of those shows where, for one, visually, I, I hate to say this because I love Kontaku's artwork. The show isn't fantastic, but it is, it's, it's okay. Like, it never gets to the point where it's like, this is horrid looking, but it's never like to the point where it's like, this is a really good looking show. Um, it's very, it's very middle area there. It's, it's just, just enough to just look okay. Um, putting that aside, I think overall the show itself, I think is one of those shows where it has a good balance. It's a good balance show in the idea that it'll have like these different segmented moments where it's either going to a comedy bit, like the whole thing with Livia getting the night, getting involved with the cult being brought there eventually at some point, literally this guy who his family has been ruined by the cult, he's coming there to get revenge. And so he wants them to prove that this cult leader can actually heal people. And so he stabs himself and Livia there the entire time is going, wow, is this a show? And everybody's freaking out. <laughs> And then she kind of resolves the whole situation. It almost like it's it's building up to a punchline. It's like, what will Livia get into next? Because she's this homeless knight that just doesn't understand the world itself. And then you have this other mixture where when it's not doing these punchlines, it's building into something wholesome. Like I said earlier with the idea of, you know, Sarah and living with Sosuke and getting into his distrust with people and having a family and his future and... All that kind of stuff. It, it's got a it's got a pleasant balance there. I will admit that the show isn't always on on full cylinders. I will I will admit that like even episodes where I did get a huge laugh out of it, like Livia's episode with the cult, the buildup wasn't really that funny. Like it was just kind of okay. This is the inside of the cult. They, they you do things to help the cult. Then you come in here and you and you sign this chart. And then they'll give you these tickets that you can use within the cult place to buy food. Well, why wouldn't you get paid for it? Well, we don't have a necessity for money. So we we just get the tickets and the tickets allow us to do fun time on the, like, play, play basketball for the day or whatever like that. So it's like it's explaining the cult and it's like, I just don't really care. And then it gets to the punchline. I'm like, okay, that was good. I like that. Um, the whole thing with the build up with, with Sosuke going with Sarah out to find out this lady's cheating on them. They're... They're sitting out in the car the whole time, and it's got this whole joke routine where Sarah is showing that she can make herself invisible, but she can't make her eyes invisible, otherwise she can't see anything. So she's got this floating head that's floating around, and at some point, she gets tired of waiting, and so she's like, I'm going to go check on the lady, and so she jumps over the, or she flies over the fins, and then she catches an eyeball of the the wife of that that household just going at it with the the gardener. It's got like these like build-up moments of comedy to some really funny moments. It's got a good mixture of all this stuff kind of build together. But I will admit that a lot of the cases, there's these, these moment to moments within each episode where I'm like, it's just not doing anything to entertain me right now. So, but I think overall, I really enjoyed the show. I was, I was very pleasantly surprised how much it did well in balancing comedy, wholesome slice of life, fantasy elements, mixing all this stuff together to make a salad bowl, <laughs> a salad bowl of eccentrics um, to the title's name. It's pretty much what it is. I don't recall if they announced another season. I don't think they announced another season for this, but I would actually really like another season of the show because I think it just has... I think what makes it work so well is its cast is... is Its cast is solid. Now, I will admit, Sosuke is... He's a good dude. He, he It kind of gets into him and his being disenchanted by society. It gets into his you know, childhood when to grow up to be a great detective, just like, you know, like Detective Conan, like he has a ton of Detective Conan magazines. Eventually Sarah ends up finding them and she gets into the idea of being a, a great detective too. And she's talk, constantly talking to him about, why don't you go do like those big murder mysteries and stuff like that? Or do, do like crack a big case. And he's like, that, that's not what detectives norm, normally do. Um, and it does give this little moment of almost her kind of inspiring him to get back into that feeling of justice and trying to help people or whatnot, doing good things because at some point, he was in a really nasty um, agency, 
and he left the agency because they were they were doing bad deals. So it kind of gets into him being re-sparked, but I think overall he's just a good guy. He's taking care of Sarah. I like that. But I think Sarah is probably like a big nugget of fun of this show because she's just a she's just a goofball. Like the whole segment where she's in school, my gosh, was just absolutely pure comedy gold. <laughs> The her the whole segment like at some point again like she said um, I kind of spoiled the idea of him uh, adopting her. Um, eventually the, the, they were doing that because he wanted to she wanted to go to school, and so it goes this whole segment where she's going to school and literally everybody, like all the students, all the even all the parents are like seeing calling her Sarah Sama. <laughs> like everybody thinks like she's the greatest. Like you have this like a brief moment where people are trying to bully her. Because, like, literally every boy is trying to ask her out. <laughs> and they go with this whole segment where, like, they try to lock her up inside the the storage closet, whatever. And she just, like, uses her magic to blast open the door. And she's perfectly fine. But she's so nice about it. Like, she's just kind of, like, you know, it's it's cool, whatever. She's completely, she completely forgives them. So immediately the girl's like, let me, let me, let me be your dog. <laughs> Like, everybody wants to be her dog or her, her boyfriend or whatever. And then, like I said, eventually it kind of leads into everybody, basically. Even the parents are just l in love with her. So, it was it was fantastic. They had they had that whole segment. It was great. Sarah is just... She's a bundle of fun. I absolutely love her. Like I said, I think the, the, the cream of the crop, I think, of the show is definitely Livia. She's just, again, the homeless girl that just gets wrapped up in the most obscured and, and screwed up things that she can get, let herself obliviously get pulled into. Uh, Brenda was fantastic. She's like this lawyer that is like madly in love with Sosuke. You have his ex girlfriend Haruka, who's from the previous agency. Who she's like a she's just a trap. Like she, she, her whole job is to literally get guys to fall in love with her so they can get dirt on husbands and get the maximum money for the the wife. <laughs> like they they have a wife come in and say, "Hey, um, I need dirt on my husband." They send her to to seduce them <laughs> and get the information from them. Um, they had briefly, they had a story about this one girl that was being bullied. Um, they help out. They actually did something pretty decently cool with her story. I love her, her new school that she goes to and what she does there. So overall, I really like it. It's like, it's a, I will admit that it's like a mishmash of a whole bunch of things on one. So explaining it's kind of difficult, but it just worked. It just, it just overall, I think it just really worked. I like the character designs obviously because Kontaku, but, um, and of course, I forgot to mention this earlier, but yes, the creator, the creator of Asal Bulb and Centrix is the one that created a sister's all a sister is all you need in Haganai. So I don't I say that, but it's like I it just feels so different than those shows. <laughs> it feels so I mean it, it feels a little bit like Sisters All You Need in comedy, not like the whole Syscon stuff, but it just like it feels like that a little bit. Like the comedy and the writing feels almost like that. I don't really feel like it feels like it Haganai at all, though. So Anyways, I really like it. Hopefully we'll get more of it, but uh, that's Salable of Eccentrics. Uh, let's get this one out of the way, Chris. Just rip the Band-Aid off. Um, I'm sure I'm going to make a lot of people mad. I don't know. We'll see. Well, <laughs> I could I could make people mad. Girls Band Cry. Got to talk about Girls Band Cry. Did you even touch this show? Because it was like oh. off over there somewhere. Not even licensed. Nobody even picked it up. I don't even know if they wanted it to get picked up. Maybe Toei Animation, just like, no, I don't want anybody to pick this up. But yeah, this was done by Toei Animation. Ran for 13 episodes. It's an original. Uh, genres are music. I would say drama. Heavy, heavy drama. A little bit of sprinkled comedy in there. Uh, but yeah, the writer is Juki Hanada, who did uh, script work for Sound Euphonium, Love Live, and Boku Yaba. But yeah, this one opens up with Nina. And she is... Uh, not run away from home. She got the she got the approval, sort of speak, from her family that she was going to go to the big city. And she was going to go to school there. Just get away from her family. You find out very quickly that she just doesn't really have a good relationship with especially her father. Uh, her house is very, very strict. And she's trying to get away from it. Uh, we get a hint, hint later on that uh, they, there was some incident where she was being bullied at her school. It doesn't seem like her parents, or at least her father, even stood up for her so she doesn't doesn't have a good relationship with them but yeah she's go, she's going there very quickly when she arrives there she sees a, a social media post by momoka who was used to be a part of this one uh band that she that nina used to listen to all the time she really loves this band because as she was being bullied as she was going through some terrible stuff listening to their music literally saved her life like just she felt like when she listened to them singing it felt like it was her just screaming out everything that was frustrating her and it just let her vent 
and it saved her life. So she goes to this like street side corner where Momoka, who has left the band, is performing on the street. She runs up there, says that she really likes her music, um, buys a CD from her, and then the two of them kind of get wrapped up in this like argument with another street side uh, performer. Eventually, they run off together, go back to her place, Momoka's place, where she kind of finds a little more about why Momoka left the group and what happened with them, and eventually finds out that Momoka is planning on actually leaving the town, go back home, and then Nina tries to inspire her not to give up on her dreams. You know, hey, don't give up, don't leave the home, try it out again. Which Momoka seems to think as a a statement that Nina is going to join her and they're going to make a band together because Nina is actually a really good singer. But that's not the case. Nina's like, no, I'm not planning on joining your band because I made a promise to my parents that I'm going to live on my own, but I'm going to get into college. Like, I'm going to do the interest exams. I'm going to get into college all by myself. So I can't do your band because I need to focus on studying. That didn't work out, obviously, because the show is called Girl Band Cry. So eventually she gets roped into the band. Uh, we meet their drummer, which is uh, Subaru. She's, like, going to this performance arts school because she's expected by a lot of people to follow the dreams of her grandmother and that whole thing. Eventually they find a two other individuals for the who was basically there since episode one. There were the <laughs> there were like these two people at this I think it was a noodle shop. Uh, they're like trying to find other members for their band club because they're trying to get to uh, Budokan or whatever. But yeah, they they eventually rope those two in. But yeah, it kind of just turns in them coming together, making the band trying to strike out and eventually at some point Nina gets obsessed with the idea of them trying to beat Momoka's old uh old band which I think was Diamond Dust uh Dia Dust or whatever they, they call it they shorten it but yeah it turns into kind of a comp competition between the two band groups and come to find out Nina knows the new uh singer and that's kind of a thing anyways that's uh that's girl girl band cry let me start off by talking about visuals yes full CGI now I will say very good looking. I, I will admit that, like, watching the OP, I'm like, holy crap, I love the character designs, 2D character designs. I wish this show was 2D drawn, but I know they would probably never capture that art style. But the, the 2D art style is really good. But they made some really good renders out of the characters. I think what this show nails, the, the pros and cons of their CGI style. The pros. It looks really good. The character models are really good. And the expressions of the characters are really, really good. They made these characters come to life like you would expect in a 2D animation style. The negatives, the cons. There's too much detail and like dust to a lot of the environments so that the characters don't always match the environment they're in. But that's that's not really a big negative. I would say that's kind of like just a, a nitpick. I, I think a nitpick that I can or a, a, a negative that I can actually give it is I think while I said I like the expressiveness of the characters, they're too expression like they they get to the point where they're almost looney tunes too much like it these these characters cannot keep their face from jumping off of their models it's just it's constantly their lips are jetting out constantly they're trying to be overly animated which technically gets into my main critical point that i have of this show overall let me just get all the negatives out of the way let's get all the negatives out of the way let's get it all out of here my biggest negative which pairs off of the expressiveness is it's very melodramatic. A lot. These characters seem to be constantly at each other's throat to the point where it's like, I can't I can't keep following you down this road. This would be a believable group of people because it seems like you're constantly trying to beat each other's faces in. It doesn't seem to your your actions two minutes ago doesn't seem to match your actions now, and it doesn't match your actions two minutes from now. They're just it's mostly Nina. And it's typically involving Momoka. Every now and then it involves Subaru. But most of the time, it's Nina. Nina is just way too aggro. This girl needs to chill it out. And it, and it tries to every now and then make me feel sympathetic of her because for the longest time it was going, she's from a really bad house. We're doing this thing, right, Chris? She's got some skeletons in the closet. This girl... The, the first time no, they no, show... No, 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 She killed yeah. the other girls. I was waiting for that. Dog. Because they, they, every now and then they, they would show like this little animation with the, the anxiety reds dripping off of her towards the air. And you're like, holy crap, this girl's got... She's been through some stuff. Wouldn't you know it? They have a sign in their house 
we eat dinner together. No cell phones in the living room. This girl is in lockdown. This Her family's thing. hardcore. Really? And I'm waiting for it to pan down and show a corpse. Yes, I'm, I'm waiting for it to pan down and we find out that dad killed mom, strung her up on the wall or something like that. No, we come to find out. Dad wrote a book about parenting. And he apparently is not a good parent because he didn't speak up about the bullying like he should have. Mm. Now, again, I'm not going to... I'm not going to discount bullying. Uh, the bullying situation is obviously a completely different rabbit hole um, and its own subject, which I do feel for Nina for. And I do feel for her in the idea that nobody wanted to do anything. This is a very common story in bullying and schooling, especially in Japan. So that's a, that's a, that's a believable concept there, but it's like for so much focus of the story, it was on that house and that rule book or that rule on the wall. So you're obviously, again, expecting this girl has been through some crazy stuff. And that, so I expect that that aggro from her has meaning. And so she's constantly just blowing up on people whenever anything is brought up that's a difficulty. And it's often relating to that. With Subaru, Subaru is trying to be nice to her at the restaurant. She's trying to bring Nina into the conversation because she just met her. So she's asking her what her likes are and whatever. And then suddenly Nina's like, I can't stand it. She storms off to the bathroom. Momoka comes in there and says, she's trying to be your friend. I mean, what's the deal? No, she's not. She's playing all this stuff. I've met people like her. And then the little drips come off of her again. And then she storms out of the place. And then she gets all mad because she understands that Subaru is trying to be her friend, but she can't accept that. And again, for the most part, I understand these issues. When Nina storms out of there and literally screams at the top of her lungs in the middle of nowhere, I know Subaru is trying to be my friend. She just obviously can't trust her because she's dealt with it too much where people are fake. I understand it. But it's always that extra step or that, that repeating of that whole anxiety that where I'm kind of going, at some point, you got to get a clue here. Nina is both my, not my favorite part of the story, but she is a, a very significantly good part of the story. I think a lot of her build into giving up a lot of things trying to stretch out on her own her story of discovery uh breaking out from her family trying to make this thing work all that stuff really works for me it's just whenever she's aggro or she's being like super negative to people or attacking or lashing out at people overly melodramatic i can't stand it everybody else the other characters i love them i love subaru i think subaru is probably uh, either i would probably say subaru is probably my favorite character like her story her thing with her grandmother, uh, the relationship the rest of the family has with the grandmother and how Subaru is so much different, the desires that she has that kind of breaks away from what the grandmother expects of her, um, the lies that she makes of her grandmother and trying to come clean with that. Everything around Subaru I thought was fantastic. I thought she was a, a really fantastic character. Rupa, she's she's like the mama character, like the big sister of the, of the group. I think she's just great. Her voice is fantastic. Um... Tangirl, best girl. There's a little bit of story around her, and it was really involving her family. Um, and there's like a little brief moment of it kind of showing people discriminating against her because of her race. Uh, Tomo was great. I, I think that her kind of thing with Nina was fantastic, and her fears of kind of speaking up was great. Momoka. Momoka's good, but I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of, I'm very mixed on Momoka, especially when it comes down to ultimately what they do with her character. I was she was probably the character that I I feel like I understood the least out of all of them. Like even, I think I understood Nina more than I understood Momoka in the end. Uh the ending was pretty solid. There was one aspect of it that I didn't really get and that was why they decided to pull back on the agreement that they had. It didn't really make much sense to me. I mean, I understand it from a thematic standpoint, but I don't understand it from a logical standpoint if that makes sense to people. But I I think overall Putting aside my frustrations with Nina as a super high aggro character, this kind of falls in the same boat for me as something like Bang Dream, which is surprising because they're both CGI anime shows. They both do expressions really well, um, even though some of them go a little bit too far. <laughs> um, overall, I think they kind of fall in the same category where it's really great story. It's really a great band show where characters coming together, finding commonality, obviously having, you know, issues always meshing with each other. There's a lot of cases where they 
they're all kind of walking together, but sometimes they'll kind of want to walk down this street rather than this street, and they suddenly tug, and then suddenly you have a conflict. And they do all that kind of very well. It's just, it bugs the hell out of me how much it's revolving around Nina being way too emotional about wanting to deal with something that really, in the end, doesn't really matter. She's way too caught up way too often in things that really don't matter, and everybody's kind of just forced to kind of stand there and go, why are we having to deal with this? So... All in all, overall, encompass into one. If you're okay with, I would say, like, some of the most angstiest of angstiest teens in Nina and that massive melodrama that she is, this is a really good band show. And probably go up there as one of my favorite band shows, even with its flaws. Even with my massive frustrations I have with it, I think it's a really good show. I don't know. I, I, was was I pretty positive there? Maybe, did I spend too much time on melodrama? What do, what do you get from me? Is that is that a pretty positive review? No, that you really really didn't like the melodrama. Yeah, but the rest of it, you get you, you get that I'm saying the rest of it's good though. And <laughs> Bang Dream is better than this one. No, I said. <laughs> No, this is way better. This is way better than Bang Dream is my go. If if I could put the two of them side by side, it would be like this would be like if Bang Dream if my if Bang Dream is this one would be probably let me let me think. Um, I give this a seven. I personally give it like a seven, maybe eight. It's probably seven. Bang Dream is my go. I'd probably give like a six because there's a there's a lot of that show I don't like. It's just only when it's around the singer that I like to is my go. This one, I like everything that's not Nina. <laughs> everything that's not Nina. So basically, <laughs> Andrew wants to pull the character out of that one and put it in this one and put this character in that one. Dude, that would be a perfect show, dude. <laughs> if if they just took the singer from Bang Dream is My Go and stuck him in Nina's place, it would be a good show. But I don't know. I, a lot of people like that drama. I think a lot of people like the melodrama. Now, they might not call it melodrama. Some people actually call it melodrama. Like when I did my Is My Go review... I don't... There was people that were like, yeah, I like it, though. And there was other people that were like, it's not melodrama. Like, it, 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 I feel it's melodrama. When you, when you have characters that just, yes, you can, you can chop, you can, you can label it, uh, like, angsty drama. Like, it's just, it's just kids with way too much, you know, too much, like, I don't know what it would call, like, just. Hormones. They're, hormones, yeah, they're just, they're, they're rebelling. They're rebellious, rebellious. You can call it that, but I don't know. It just, it doesn't. It doesn't work for me most of the time. Whenever it's I, just too much, I don't. I don't mind melodrama as long as it's kind of um, backed up by some kind of a payoff. And that that's my biggest issue. I it, it I don't. I understand the idea that teens are going to over exaggerate things. Yeah. I get that. I, I've I've dealt with kids. I I understand it. Um, but at the same time, I mean, at least have a logical thought process. I mean it. I, it, there's there's kind of this, there's an ebb and flow I think to it. Like yeah. you have at least for relationships, there's an ebb and flow that has to happen there. And I feel like with Nina and a lot of these characters, especially Mamaka and Nina, there's a lot of times where it's like it just gets pushed so far into the realm of like the flow of it being extremely toxic that the the ebbs doesn't really pay off. Like it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me that two of them are just buddy buddy the next scene. It's like, you guys should be killing each other by now. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I guess a lot of it has to do with, like, whenever there's, like, just a small issue, why are we screaming in the middle of a restaurant? Like, whoa, chill. And in Japan? <laughs> like, um, yeah, I guess I, I forgot to mention the the, the birdies. I, 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 I have to admit, like, the whole birdie thing, I, I get how edgy it is. Like, people love it. Like, it... Early on, Momoka flips off some people, and Nina asks what she did, and she says she's saying thank you, and so she flips somebody off. And so they agree, after she's told what flipping somebody off actually means, that they're going to use pinkies. And that becomes, like, their signature for the rest of the show, and I'm like, it's so, it's so dorky. Like, it's so dorky. It's like, it's so edgy. It's like, no, it's, it's, it's dorky, dude. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's so, it's so, like, I don't care, whatever. It's so cool, though. They flipped them off with the birdies. And then the other group does it, and I'm like, oh gosh, please don't. Please don't. They stole their signature, their their birdies. I don't know. It was again, like I said, I would probably give this show like a seven. Seven point five. There you go. I don't usually do point 
points on my my show, but I'll do it on here. I'll, I'll probably get like a seven point five. It was really good. As as negative I was on Nina, I think the show is the show is good. If he can still if he can stand the melodrama. Uh, let's see here. We have a few people on this Discord that are super mega fans of the show, so don't don't take my word for it. There's some there's some big. I think even anime trendings community is pretty heavy on as well. I've seen a couple of trending sites that were their their communities were really pushing it. So obviously there's a fandom there. Time for Oi Tombo or Tombo, I think is what Amazon listed as. Yes, an Amazon show, Chris. <laughs> it was a sh an anime on Amazon again. That's why nobody talked about this show. I don't think anybody would talk with this, even if it was on Crunchyroll. It's a golfing show. Come on. But I watched it. It was by it was on by OLM. Uh, genres are drama and sports. I don't think this one got a second season announcement. I think it did. I don't remember. I think it did. I think it did. It needs one, if that's the case. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, based on a manga. Drama is sports is the genres. And this one follows a guy named... Uh, Igaiga is what they call him eventually. He's uh, Kazuyoshi Igarashi. I'm going to call him Igarashi going forward because Igaiga, Igaiga is very hard to want to say. Iga, 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 I think is how they say it. Anyways, he's a, he's a golfer that kind of had some really rough times. We find out later on exactly what happens, but he's going through some rough times and he decides to uh, just go out, you know, collect himself. He decides to go out to uh, Hinoshima Island where he gets a job there at this development center. And at some point, very quickly, he runs into this little girl named Tombo Oi, which I think she's like 10 or 10 or something like that, 10 or 12. She's very young. And yeah, he meets her very quickly. She kind of welcomes him to go to this one golf course they have on the island, and they play golf together. And very quickly, he discovers that Tombo has... She's very unorthodox. <laughs> like she is just, she plays golf in the most off the wall ways. Obviously, this girl was self taught. <laughs> we kind of find out at some point that she, and she always uses one club. We find out at some point that um, her parents um, left. I think her father was going to a golf tournament, and he left behind one club, um, and she, he they went off on this flight, end up dying. And so Tombo, now having no family, she kind of has this one club that was from her father that she never lets go. Um, they eventually take her to the island where she is raised by this this guy there that she calls grandpa. And yeah, so she's been basically self-teaching herself golf with just this one club. And so everything, putting, uh, long drives, everything she does with this one same club. And this completely blows away uh, Igarashi because, again, he's a pro golfer. He's used to using all the clubs and how she's able to pull all this stuff off with just one club. And, again, how she thinks differently than everybody else is just kind of brilliant. Like how she gets out of, you know, the sand pits or whatever. She uses a special type of uh, swing, how her stance is and everything like that. Everything she does just completely fascinates him. But at the same time, there's a couple things that he's kind of finding an issue with her. One is that she doesn't really have a drive of competition. He's thinking very quickly, this girl can go gold. Like, if I can get her to go to the main island and play golf, this girl is going to be able to take out any competition. But there's two main problems. She's so unorthodox, she doesn't have a sense of challenge because in her... A best way to put it is at some point, he says, um, well, what, what would happen if you did hit that ball that direction and the wind didn't take it to the hole? Well, I would just swing again. That's completely different to him than to think of the idea that, no, if you did that, you would have failed, and then you wouldn't have gotten a second chance. You have no sense of competition where you get only one shot. Her mindset is, whatever, we're just playing for fun, right? Let's just hit the ball again. The second problem is that she doesn't want to leave the island. <laughs> she does not want to leave the island. Now, they have... They establish very quickly that they... It's a very small island. The population is very small. So their school only goes up to, I think, middle school. Once you get there, all the kids have to leave the island to go to high school or whatever. And so they're expecting her. They're, they're wanting her to leave the island eventually to continue her schooling, but she does not want to leave. And he wants her to leave because he wants to actually, you know, take her and enter her into the competitions, but she won't leave the island. So it kind of turns very quickly into trying to get her to leave, trying to figure out some way of encouraging her and that involves, like, he contacts a, a friend who has a, a daughter that's in, that actually plays golf professionally. 
and has that girl come over to play with Tombo, just kind of encourage her to go, you know, compete. Uh, eventually, they go to another island where the guy that built the golf course, he built another golf course. So that kind of see if he can bait her into going to this at least another island nearby to, to, to at least extend her, broaden her horizons a little bit. But um, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. Eventually, you get into Igarashi's backstory, what happened with him and his golfing, his profession, uh, his relationship with his family that he kind of ruined. A lot of stories around them. Uh, overall, it's kind of like, it's a mixture of multiple things. Like, yes, at the core, it is about golf. And so they'll get a little bit, they'll get a little bit preachy or at least explaining about how the golf works and what she's doing that's so different that makes her unique. But I never felt like that stuff got a little, it it never got too heavy. I think it was, it did enough that it wasn't trying to bore me out of my mind because, shocker, I'm not a fan of golf. <laughs> I don't, I think golf is like it's not on the lowest end of the totem poles of things like i would i would be fine if a friend says hey you want to go shoot a couple of balls like i used to do that all the time uh, with my last job especially every now and then hey you want to go down to the golf course hit a couple of balls sure let's go you got like a salesman goes over let's hit the golf course whatever i've done plenty of that it's not the lowest end of the totem pole for me but it's not the most interesting sport like i'm never gonna watch a golf game <laughs> no matter what if it's on television i would rather watch football i'd rather watch basketball those are a lot more entertaining than watching a golf game I, i'll just, watch billiards 10 day 10 yeah, times billiards, over hell everything yeah. else golf no <laughs> golf is the most boring sport to ever watch if i'm part of it that's fine i'll, I'll hit a ball into a, a gutter all day anyways uh, so it's it's nice that this show wasn't too heavy on the golf stuff, but it every now and then did. I will admit, every now and then did. What I liked about this show is just the characters. This is a very character-driven show about a guy who is disenchanted by golf and his family and his life, meeting just the most the most liveliest of kids. Like Tombo is just special in so many ways. She is absolutely this just Kind of like I was talking about earlier with Sarah, but more toned down. Tombo is just the essence of purity. She is just this kid that just sees the positive in everything. She sees the joy in everything. And so she extremely, extremely counters what you're seeing with Igarashi and his seemingly hatred of everything. Or at least... World like, not, not He's not hatred of things. He's just that he's World lost. he's lost joy. He's lost the... He's lost seeing that golf can be fun. He's that guy. Every now and then we get those shows where it has the... This this one is the one that sees the fun in it. And this is the one that has to be retold that it's for fun, right? Sports are fun, right? Oh, that's right. Sports can be fun. It's that whole thing. But it's, yeah, it's getting into the, the island itself. The people of the island. Grandpa of Tombo. And he's kind of like a... He's just a grumpy teddy bear. You have um, the nurse that's at the island. They get into her for a little bit. Um, just each individual characters of the island and their their hope for Tombo and her future and her hopefully eventually getting over the trauma of her her parents and eventually hopefully leave the island. But yeah, overall, I, I really love the show, though. I think it's just a lot of it has to do with just the chemistry between Tombo and Igarashi. A lot of it's kind of this fun thing where he'll go out golfing with her one afternoon and... She'll do some crazy thing, some crazy hit, or just see the scene a little bit differently than he does. And he just gets, he doesn't even think about it. He gets his grumpy face. And so she turns to him and says, you have that grumpy look on your face again. Every time she does some crazy hit that should not be possible, he just gets this grumpy face. <laughs> not that he's mad. He just gets this grumpy face. It just subconsciously creates it. Um, just them together is just fantastic. Just a, And again, a lot of it's kind of just seeing how Tombo ticks and him trying to understand her. It's just, it's really interesting. I actually found a lot of stuff kind of interesting, uh, um, enjoyable. Now, a little bit, like, later on, as the show goes on, I will, f I do feel like a lot of that stuff kind of gets a little bit repetitive, just this kind of cycle of, you know, trying to figure out how she works and how she sees golf and how the game plays in her head, really. Some of that stuff does kind of get repetitive, but I think it really quickly pivots into the goal towards a later part, which is how do I get her off this island? How do I get her to broaden her horizons and to get over the trauma that she has to go into her future, a possible future of being a, a big golfer? 
um, that stuff kind of pivots it in a way that kept it fresh and kept it moving forward. So um, I really enjoyed it in the end. I thought this was kind of a – I won't oversell it to people. It is a sports show with character and heart. It's a very it's a very heart driven show, but at the same time, I will admit that stepping back after it was all done and looking back at it is not as if this show really did anything that really stood out to me. I would probably the best way to describe it is um, what was the one show where the guy was what was he a writer and he went back to his hometown and there was that little rug rat. Um, of course, that one was like super Barakamon? hyper. Barakamon, yeah. I would say it's like Barakamon, where you have like, because he was like a disenchanted character coming back to this area, and that was just like this little Spitfire girl. Not that, like that girl in, in, in Barakamon, she was just hyper as all get. Not that level. Tombo is not that level of energy. She is energetic, but she's she's grounded in reality energetic. Like she's a normal kid. <laughs> I feel like Barakamon, she was like a little gremlin. Um, it's kind of like that show. I would feel like it's very much like that show, but it's all about, again, him rediscovering the joy of golfing and, and her skills in it. So it's a, it's a good way to put it. So anyways, that's, that's, oi, Tombo. It's a really decent show. Decent, decent show. Oh my gosh. This show finally ended. I guess it was only like, what, three cores? It was Yatra. Wasn't it a remake three cores total? Or was, did it get to four cores? It went four cores, right? remember i think both seasons were two core seems like it yeah it was yeah because we had two ops and ad's for the first core and this was two so yeah yeah Udise yatsura uh the new series second season i'm not gonna call it a 2022 second season that's a stupid title uh but yeah this one was on high dive that was the high dive show uh done by david productions based on a manga comedy romance sci-fi supernatural they already announced rama they're oh, doing yeah. it they're doing yeah. it they're <laughs> doing it <laughs> I just like please don't uh I just don't I don't know it with how again I I, I acknowledge that Udise Yatsura is not like the most like insanely nudie type of show but it just it does it does feel like they kind of choned it down and I don't see him being able to do that with Rama <laughs> I don't see them doing that with Rama um they'll figure out something I'm sure but anyways yes back to Udise Yatsura this one is again by Rumi, Rumiho Takahashi who of course did Rama one half uh, Mason Kikaku Inuyasha, but um, this is the re the ultimate, the ultimate, the ultimate flag in the it would be Inuyasha redoing Inuyasha. I think they should. Yeah, I, I would be, I would be fine for that. I, I didn't care for Rene, and that was just kind of a, eh. But anyways, back to Inuyasha. Uh, Inuyasha, who is <laughs> Um Yeah, this one is. For those who don't know, it follows Ataru, who at some point this alien invasion happens. They claim they're going to take down or destroy or overtake the world, but they given the humans of the the actual planet a chance by saying we're going to randomly select one person, and that person is going to compete with um, with us to see if you're going to get taken over. And the random generator finds Ataru, who is this kind of womanizer guy, is going to be the person that's going to save the world, and so he's pinned against the 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 leader's daughter Lum, if he can catch her and, and grab her horns by the time this one day ends, he will save the world. And yeah, during their whole kind of competition, eventually he says something to the effect of that he's going to marry Shinobu, who's this girl that he likes. But Lum takes it wrong, which is the daughter of this king. Lum takes it wrong in thinking that he wants to marry her. And so when he somehow manages to trick her and grab the horns, she agrees that she's going to marry him. And then thus begins Atharu's daily routine of going to school, hitting on every single girl in the world, while at the same time being pursued by Lum, this alien girl who wants to, who thinks that she's married with him. And then he constantly pushes her away, even though she's incredibly hot in her little tiger bikini. <laughs> and let you kiss him all, all every, two day, every two seconds. But anyways... Well, the Getting only one in. that he doesn't want is the one that wants him. Right. Otherwise, it would be too easy. Mm -hmm. But anyways. But yeah, to that note, yes, slight spoilers here. We're getting into the final arc, final episodes. This is it. This is concluded. We have the last episode has been aired. Um, we're finally, at least with this, uh, at least especially for the second core of this whole thing, finally pushing into the realm of, yes, Atro at some point having to acknowledge that 
he does like Lum. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the big, you know, climactic moment of the series. Shocker here, I know, spoilers. Eventually getting to a point where Lum is trying to push Otro to finally admit that. And that's kind of the thing here. I The, the earlier segments of this core, or this last season, was r kind of a mixture for me. I will, th I, this kind of goes into my overall review of the entire series, honestly, is I love Udase Yatsura. This has been a massive nostalgia trip. I think they did a fantastic job choosing the seiyus for this. Like, I mean, we got like Araragi's seiyus for Ataru. Um, I forget who was uh, doing Lum, but her Lum seiyu is fantastic. She absolutely nails that verbal tick that she has, the cha that she has. She's super cute. All the seiyus of this show, I mean, even Shutaro has um, the guy from Zombieland Saga. Absolutely incredible seiyus. This, this, this entire show has an absolutely stellar cast of seiyus. And David Productions nailed the art style. They managed to bring that old art style, which is, yes, decades old at this point, <laughs> and build it into a new adaptation that looks absolutely incredible. They, they just pulled out of the stops. This show looks incredible, sounds incredible, everything. But I will admit that it does show its age. <laughs> this is a day and age where the comedy is literally Ataru just tries to glomp onto every single girl and Lum shows up and electrocutes him. That's the shtick. And no matter what the current plot line is, what we're talking about in the current episode, Arthur, the entire episode, will be jumping on women and they'll be smacking them into the wall while they're talking about the current subject. Hey, suddenly out of nowhere, a bottle rocket appeared in the middle of the classroom. Why is there a bottle rocket in the middle of the classroom? I don't know. The entire time they're talking about the bottle rocket and why it's there, Atoro jumps onto Shinobu and she slaps him away. And then he jumps onto Sakura and she slaps him away as they're explaining why the bottle rocket's in the middle of the room. It never stops. And it just keeps having the same jokes over and over again. And that's where, again, I feel like that age is shown. I will fully acknowledge that. My love of this show, and it was my love of the original show, is nostalgia. I love the nostalgia trip here in that this is a property that I grew up with. I loved it to death back in the day. I'm re-experiencing it here. I think it looks great and it's presented well, but I can admit that once they introduce the joke, which is really the introduction of each character is their joke, it will just play the joke over and over again while they introduce another character and they play the same jokes. So when they introduce Ron to the story, Yavatru obviously falls in love with her, wants to get with her. But then Lum doesn't like that because Lum is supposed to be married to him. So she electrocutes him. And at the same time, Ron doesn't have any care for Atru. <laughs> it's just going to do this with every single character. That the Mostly, it's all kind of meshed together with me. But I think most of this season has been the introduction of Asuka, which is the brother of Tomimaru. Um, I think we got mostly into that in the connection to Shutaro. Um, then eventually we introduced the... This one organization that, or this this group of bad guys that had signed an agreement with Lum's grandfather to marry her off, and that eventually leads into, again, Lum eventually pulling Ataru to say what he really thinks. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. If he doesn't love me, it's fine. I'll leave, but I just want to know what he really thinks, and that that was a good. And I don't even remember that whole segment in the original one, so it was a. It was kind of a, a almost me kind of experiencing it again for the first time ever because I just don't remember any of it. And it was a it was a cool little ending. I thought it was really kind of sweet. But yeah, overall, like I said, if you're not. Here's a toughy thing. It's like one of those aspects of like, could I recommend this to a new anime fan? It's like if you want to experience Udise Atra, it's the best way to do it because it's so condensed they cut out a lot of the fluff that you got from the old adaptations. Like, the old adaptations was a lot of original content. This one, it kind of stuck with... It really kind of zeroed in with the manga to the introductions of every character and got to the, the bullet points. Um, they really did kind of pull out a lot of the fluff in between. So it did feel... I, 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 spelled, I felt especially for the first season, that felt a little disjointing. Like, it was pushing too, too fast. But I think in the end, it was a nice kind of cliff notes of introductions, getting the core element of each of the characters bringing them together getting the chemistry going and then concluding so it's not the penultimate way of experiencing everything in Udase Yatsura but it is the best way for a new fan to consume this because let's be let's be clear the the old stuff is old 
<laughs> it is old. It's a comedy that's very, it's a very uh, distinct comedy and flavor of itself because again, it's old. So I enjoyed it though. It was it was a good ride. Um, it was a good adaptation. Had some really good episodes in this this particular final season. So it's good stuff. The the heart eating one was really good in this this season. And uh, the the ones that I loved the most was I I I did like the later part of it with um the um God I forget what the name of the group is Do I even have the person on here I don't the bad guys the bad guys that were supposed to marry Lum they're not really bad guys the the people that made the agreement with with the um the grandfather that whole segment was good I I love the the cow bite where oh man there was I was I think I told you about this there was one episode where Lum gets bit by a cow. And she thought that she was going to get disease from it. And she ended up, like, watching some drama or fell asleep when she was watching a TV show or something like that. And she got it in her head that she was going to transform. And <laughs> at some point, she's freaking out. And she thinks that she's sick. And so she's trying to basically say goodbye to Octro. And at some point, he realizes, no, I don't want you to leave. And he goes to stop her. And there was this incredible shot on the side of the street where it's like David Production just goes crazy with the animation. I'm like, why does this look so good? <laughs> it's such a dumb scene, but it's so good looking. Um, it just kind of came out of nowhere. But yeah. The Girl's Last Wish episode was real fantastic. Like I said, the heart-eating segment was really fun. Um, the Fate Door stuff was okay. It had its own twist there because the whole Fate Door thing was really the what-ifs. Who Who is Atru? Who is Shinobu going to end up with? Who is Atru going to end up with? It's like one of those kind of this is the future that can be kind of things. Um, that was it was kind of a good episode. So yeah, that's that's who to say Yatra. Nostalgia. It's nostalgia, dude. Oh wow, it's been a long time since I've talked about this show. Tonari no Yokai song, Chris. That show ended. Did you ever get a chance to even peek at this one? No. No. Mm. Tonari no Yokai san. This one straight on Crunchyroll, done by Leiden Films, based on a manga, Slice of Life Supernatural. And this one opens up. It's, it takes place in a world that the exist. There is the existence of supernatural things, Tengu, Nekomata, all that kind of stuff in this world. And it seems like it's normal. Like there's they're on television. There there's they're like a there's a news broadcast and there's a Tengu sitting at the table talking about the weather. Um, the existence of all these different supernatural things is a normal thing in this world. And we have multiple perspectives in the storytelling of this, which I think is supposed to be a full adaptation. Just based on what I looked at the manga, it looked like it was paced to be a full adaptation. So I could be wrong there, but I think it is a full adaptation. Um, a lot of the focus is um, Mutsumi. Who Mutsumi is this girl who at some point in the past, recent past, her father disappeared. They they believe that he may have been, he may have fell in or been sucked into like the void or this darkness. Um, so there, there currently is investigations going on to see if they can find her, uh, find him. Um, she, the, she kind of has like a replacement father figure in Jiro, who is this um, crow tengu that actually protects the land that she lives in, which is like this rural, this rural town area. Um, a lot of a majority of the focus is actually on Buccio, and Buccio is a very interesting perspective because he is a cat that this family cat that one day woke up to be a nekomata. And so randomly out of nowhere, boop, there comes out another tail, and he sits upright, and he's talking to the family like, yeah, I can talk now. This is kind of weird. What am I? What, what is this existence? What am I doing here? And so it kind of turns into him, um, his desires to kind of repay his family because he was this stray cat that was nearly dead that this mother found and brought them in the house and took care of him. So he loves his family. So he wants to do his best to kind of repay the family at the same time. He's trying to figure out what he is. It It is almost a sense of him having like an existential crisis. Like he's having this, uh, some sort of midlife crisis moment where suddenly he's trying to figure out what he is and what his future is. And yes, a lot of that has to do with what is my expectation as a Nekomata, as a yokai. What, what, how, he has to get life insurance. Like there's, this diff there's different life insurance he has to sign up for. He's getting calls about working at a company, everything. So there's all these different things that he's trying to figure out how he can transform, how to transform, training himself to transform. Um, there's a lot of things that he's now discovering. And there is a core thing about it is now that he is cognizant of what he is now as a Nekomata, what is his, as they call it in the show, his essence? What is his essence and being? which is this idea of what you are working to, like, which for him seems to be his family. He wants to do everything for his family. 
So yeah, he's meeting a lot of different Tengo, figuring out what he's supposed to do, figuring out his powers. Um, there's a couple other perspectives. Like we at some point we jump to this girl named Rin, and she is a kappa, and she's doki doki for this boy in her class, but she's a little bit hesitant and showing her 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 true sides and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's most of it. it. It jumps around to a lot of other characters, but that's mainly the one is Musumi, uh, the Crow Tengu, Jiro, Buchio, which is the Nekomata, and just a sprinkle of other characters. The overall plot line is really just kind of each of these people living side by side, um, different oddities about the world and accepting that there is all these different types of yokais and whatnot living side by side. So it, it's almost like one of those, one of those ones where it's, it, it takes this concept where here is a reality and here's how it works, basically. How would a society work with so many different oddities living side by side? And I think it did a good job of that overall. What made the show so great and this kind of extends to what I was kind of expecting of the show. Coming in the show, I seen Natsumi's Book of Friends. And for those who don't know, Natsumi's Book of Friends is like one of my favorite shows of all time. And what Natsumi's Book of Friends does so well is it introduces a yokai or some sort of supernatural thing, an element, and then it'll have a story behind it. This one, while I thought that going into it, it's not really that, but it does have kind of a similar setting and it does have... I would say some equal uh, plot points that are just as emotional. I think everything around Mutsumi, her, um, again, her separation from her father, that feeling of almost like she wants to grieve for him but doesn't want to give up at the same time, uh, her finding a lot of comfort in Jiro, which is this Crow Tengu, and his his kind of protecting and and being that surrogate father for her. And again, a lot of the insecurities and struggles that Bushio, which is the Nekomata, is going through and having a self-discovery and his desire to to help his family. That stuff is all really good. But I think most of the stuff around Zero and Mutsumi, I think, were like most of what I really loved about the show. Everything outside of that was just kind of world building. I would say that. Uh, there are some very emotional moments with Bushio, and a lot of it has to do with his fears of losing his family and living beyond them because he is a Nakamata now he's going to he's going to outlive them to a far degree um his fears of losing his family and this new life that he's going to be having but again like most of it I think I liked was Mutsio uh, Mutsumi and, and Jiro so yeah overall I found it to be a very interesting show I think visually it looked really solid um had a kind of unique style to it um, there was some plot points here and there that I thought were not as interesting. I think a lot of the stuff around Yuri was a little bit of a difficult one for me, and that was mainly around the idea that she has... They get into her story eventually, and the idea that she's a Bakakitsune, and in her original branch of... Or the main branch of her family, there was, like, this whole story about her uh, being instilled upon her by her father about the idea of being prideful for the bloodline that she has of Bakakitsune, Whereas the other branch families, a lot of them don't really see as much of a pride in it. And that was kind of jarring to her. So a lot of her story around her and her difficulties with her family, I felt was a little bit too much. And I didn't really fully understand her. And she became, she obviously very much so, in the fact that she is helping Bushio figure out his abilities, she clashes with him a lot. Because Bushio over here... Yeah, he has a really good relationship with his family, so she's constantly, like, really angry about the whole situation. So there was some of that stuff that I really didn't care much for, but I think overall, all the stories I really liked. And I think I uh, the thing I love most about this show and the story is how well it all just kind of works. Like, it just, it feels like a world that would, is believable with its nature of having so many oddities within it. Now... Gotta feel like this is very similar to what I was talking about earlier with Train of the World. Uh, Train of the End of the World. This, just like Train of the End of the World, everything's really, really good. Up until the ending. <laughs> now, the ending's not bad. It's not... There's not anything specifically about the ending that I didn't like. It feels like it all kind of fits to the mechanics of the world itself. Because they play heavily on this idea that there is time dimensions. Or different dimensions that are all kind of parallel with each other. And every now and then they can sort of collide. 
and they've they've been sprinkling this throughout the entire series, so this is not a shock. Like at some point out of nowhere, these kids are they're playing out in the the playground of the school, and suddenly there's this crack in the the the, the sky, and this random yokai just drops down and just goes berserk, running around attacking people. And so they establish this idea that there is like these other worlds, and sometimes the barrier between them will crack, and then stuff can get through it. And there's like this whole research organization that travels around and researches it. At some point, a train shows up as they're experimenting and checking this one area, and this this lady comes walking out of the train, and they're like, what is this train doing here? And then they go to confront the lady and ask her where the train came from, and she panics because she's never seen a yokai before, and this yokai just walking up with his his construction hat on asking her what she's what she's doing there, and she flips out and runs screaming bloody murder. She came from another world. So it kind of shows this idea that these these worlds can sometimes collide and people can jump between the two worlds. And there's there's presumably this aspect of maybe like a lot of the yokai and whatnot having originally traveled through these cracks. And that becomes like a central point towards the later part, but they try to use that to explain like spirited away and and the uh maybe the exorcisms be throwing them in, in there uh no no i mean you could <laughs> you could i wouldn't i wouldn't say i don't think that they i don't recall them specifically doing that no cuz i i think that 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 would work as a as an explanation for this some of that there there is there is conversations about spiriting away in the show but i don't it wasn't necessarily 100 percent tied with that so because i mean the idea with mitsumi is what they what they assume early on with mitsumi's father is that he was spared away um that gets into that whole that whole thing about the voids and how they're this this nothingness cloud that sometimes can absorb people and all that kind of stuff but yeah it, it kind of just built up in this big whole like massive world ending thing that was like a, apocalyptics and then the, the everything was fine about the last arc and the build up and what was going on and the threat, but it was just more of the <sighs> power of kids wishing is really what it comes down to. It just it was just a it was such a nothing end. It was just kind of this whole like because we wished it and it just happens and it was just kind of this. I mean, I understand it. Them I understand it thematically, but at the same time, it was just kind of a. Okay, whatever. Anyways, <laughs> it was it was the ending was just whatever, and it doesn't break the show. But at the same time, it was just kind of a super shrug ending. Um, it was okay. It was okay. But yeah, my enjoyment of the show was everything building up to that. It was just a lot of very emotional stories, a lot of human nature, even from the perspective of something like a cat, a nekamata, a lot of um, aspects of family loss outliving each other uh protecting the ones that you love the the frustrations that can come from somebody that is being protected and wanting to protect the ones that's protecting them all that stuff kind of comes into play existential crisis with a cat all that stuff i think it was a really great show i won't say it's it's, it's definitely a gem of the season because i don't really think anybody really watched the show but at the same time it's not like something i'm going to put on a pedestal it was a, just a really good show. If you're a fan of things like Natsumi's Book of Friends and stuff like that, it's definitely something to check out. So, yeah. Tonari no Yokai-san. Really good little show. Last one for the day. Last one. Um, that's not what I want to do. What is even that button? <laughs> I don't even know what that button does. We have Mysterious Disappearances as our last show. Uh, this one is Kai to Otome to Kami Kakushi. This one ran on Crunchyroll, ran for 12 episodes, done by Zero G, based on a manga, Echi, Mystery, Romance, Supernatural. And this one was directed by the guy that worked on Battery and Pupa. I don't know what that, I don't, I don't know why I brought that up. Uh, anyways, yeah, this one follows, uh, early on it follows uh, Sumireko Ogawa, and she is a failed author. I mean, she was a really well-known author when she was younger she wrote a really popular book it it sold like crazy but now that she's in her 20s late 20s i think in the the first episode she just went to 28 she's kind of going that really that that midlife crisis moment already where she's just kind of a deadbeat and she's a failed author and she wished that she had all the inspiration that she had when she was younger all that kind of stuff anyways she works at a bookshop next to a boy named rin uh adoshino and Rin 
absolutely loves older women. So she's like super into her and she's like super busty. She's like the most busty Japanese woman I've ever seen. Uh, but yeah, he's super into her, but she kind of keeps brushing him off as a kid. You know, when, when you get older, well, then we'll talk. But yeah, at some point, this book shows up in the bookstore. Manager walks up with it, says that it's a, um, basically somebody left it on the counter somewhere and just offers it to her, says, hey, it's your birthday, right? Here, have this this book that somebody left on the counter. And she takes it home, reads it, and come to find out this is what we find out later is what they call a curiosity, which is like objects that have kind of somehow leaked into the world that are cursed or altered in some way. And so when she's reading the book, it, which has all these different passages of different um, poetry, she ends up reading one that is a, basically a story about um, this desire for somebody else to become younger again so they don't die. And as she's reading the passage, she suddenly de-ages. <laughs> she becomes like a young kid again. And she is completely filled once again with all the inspiration that she needs. So she's just running around, writing down everything, and she's full of inspiration. Well, at some point, Rin, she doesn't come to school, or she doesn't ever come to work, so he looks into what's going on with her, sees if she's sick or something like that, kind of find out there's a sign of curiosity. See, Rin, he's actually somebody that hunts curiosities, which you'll find out later on with exactly the reason that he does that. And he really quickly realizes that there's signs of a curiosity in her apartment. She's no longer there, so he goes to hunt her down, finds her, sure enough, this thing that she read is a curiosity, and tries to get her to give it up. But she doesn't want to give it up because... She's suddenly becoming inspired to write again. This is all she wants. and But he's like, you don't realize what you've read has n made you look younger, yes, but you still have all that fleshed. So if you are now this small when you were this big, especially this big, <laughs> you're cramming all that tissue and that all that mass down into his little body, you're going to die. And sure enough, there's like blood go gushing out of her ears and her eyes, but she doesn't want to give it up because writing's her everything, and she's she feels like she'll never write again unless she's in this form. Anyways, he ends up helping her out, takes the book from her, kind of talks her into, you know, look, I'm a big fan of yours. Just give it the book. I'll read anything you write. You know, don't die like this kind of thing. Ends up getting the book from her. We find out, yes, the bigger story is that this Rin uh, is essentially this curiosity hunter where he goes around and looks for curiosities, captures them, and takes them back to this train station that's in this parallel dimension. And at this train station, he is trying to get enough curiosities to give to the ticket master um, in order to gain the ability to send his sister back to their world. Because he and his sister Oto are from a different world, and they're in this world now, and in order to get tickets to go back there, He's got this. So he ends up getting joined by uh, Sumireko, and she helps him out with a couple of cases. The one case, a lot of the cases are really in Oto's school that she's going to, where kids are like burning up and falling over and saliving because something's affecting them and they have to leave the school. So they're trying to figure that out. Eventually gets into some other girl that has like this knocking ghost that comes door to door and knocks on the door. And if you answer it, you disappear. Uh, a lot of different little stories. They even get into like a. A VTuber, a VTuber curiosity, which was, that was interesting, um, all the way until the anime original ending, which, yes, they had an anime original ending for this one, which I, okay, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't bad, but at the same time, it wasn't good. Uh, this definitely got pretty close to where the, the manga was at towards the later part there, and it felt like they just wanted to kind of wrap it up and anime original it, so I kind of doubt this one's ever going to probably ever get another season because of how... The anime original it. It doesn't really... Unless they just kind of pull something out their butt for the first episode of the second season. I don't know how they can do it, but they might figure out something. But yes, my thoughts on Mysterious Disappearance. Overall, I think this show is... It's kind of in that middle area where it's like I... There's some episodes that are so freaking good. When this show focuses on the curiosities and the horror... And it doesn't hold anything back. It's gritty. It's unsettling in a lot of regards. It's super good. Like the whole thing with um, the 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 curiosity at the school. That's all I'll say. The, the curiosity at the school where suddenly the kids, their bodies feel like they're on fire. And they start like foaming at the mouth. And they just kind of collapse on the ground. And they have to get them out of the school. They have like this massive fever. When they get home, they're fine. 
But if they ever come back to school, suddenly they're racked with this pain again. And they're they're they feel like they're on fire and whatever. Um, come to find out, it's like anybody that was seemingly a bully is being targeted by this thing, or at least any indication that they might be bullying somebody. Suddenly, they have this this happen to them. And when they finally get, they confront the actual curiosity. It was really cool. Like I said, super unsettling and super kind of brutal in a lot of regards. When this show focuses on curiosities and the oddities, it doesn't hold anything back. It's super gritty. It's even etchy in a lot of regards. It just doesn't, it has no filters. And that's, that's the part that I really love about the show. It has no filters. But anything outside of the actual curiosities where it's just focusing on the character interactions and almost like slice of life moments it's kind of boring <laughs> it's a it's kind of a boring show when it's just characters messing around like the whole build up to the curiosity in the school is sumireko after the whole incident with her having the curiosity and using it to shrink herself she becomes cursed herself so she can just recite the lines and shift whenever she wants at that point and it seems like her body is used to it because she never, like, bleeds out anymore. So she was using it to de-age herself a little bit so that she can go to school with Oto to find this curiosity. And it turns this whole thing where she suddenly is inspired to write, but she's doing it by listening to the kids talk about romance and having girl talk and stuff like that. And she's super in the idea of just listening to them talk about girl talk because it's giving her fuel to write her novels. She's even talking about, like, she wants to write a bunch of Yuri novels or whatever about relationships at an all-girls school. And it's just boring. <laughs> like, the whole segments of her just hanging out with the other girls and Otto, it's just super boring. And then out of nowhere, like I said, the curiosity shows up and suddenly things get super awesome. Like, it's just a great little segment there of, like, Rin having to use build in and Sumireko's over here and she's been set on fire because this thing licked her shadow and suddenly she's just in a blaze. Like everything goes crazy gritty. And then that gets resolved and then we're back to Sumireko going to school with Oto still and they're having girl talk and it's boring for a little while and then suddenly out of nowhere Shizuku shows up and we get the whole door to door knocking ghost and then suddenly it gets interesting again and I'm figuring out Shizuku like literally is fearing that her friend is dead and so she goes out there and tries to sacrifice herself like all that stuff is super cool and then we get back to the character just hanging out again it's just like when the show is into the oddities and it's into the curiosities and it's into the horror and it's into the mystery and it's super like especially the manga i actually was reading some of the manga alongside of it it's super deep with its lore and it's the oddities and the folk tales and the yokais and the references of poetry and all this kind of stuff. It's super deep. But when the show is doing just regular character moments, it's not good. Now, I do like individual chemistries. Like, I like Oto and Sumireko's chemistry. Great. Sumireko with the rest of the classmates suck. Rin and Sumireko, great chemistry. Ren and Oto, great chemistry. It's just like all these side characters, the chemistry just kind of falls apart. But yeah, so it's it's kind of one of those shows where like 50% of it is peak. Like it's it's 9 out of 10 stuff. I just absolutely love it. Anything horror related, I love it. Anything like anything slice of like, there's some moments like I like Sumireko and Oto um, when she had to take care of Oto for a little bit because Ren had to go fix his eyeball. <laughs> that whole segment was super sweet. But most everything slice of life it just doesn't work. Like this writer's not good at that stuff. This writer's good with all the other stuff. So anyways, I, I think I've repeated myself three times now. I in the end I liked it. Um the anime original ending was okay. It was a good wrap up, but it was just extremely blitzed. Like it felt like it felt like everything built up to, holy crap, things are hitting the fan. And then, like, all the dominoes fell into place and it wrapped up. It was like, okay, yeah, that's kind of how I expected you could wrap that up. Sure, that's fine. Got it. Cast scroll, I'm fine. So it's not a bad ending, but it, it felt very, it felt very um, safe, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, I can expect this, this is what I expected kind of thing. So, yeah, overall, solid watch if you're into horror mystery type of stuff. Um, definitely not a dark gathering. I'd rather, like, if it weren't for the visuals and the, this show got some good etchy. There's some good etchy in the show here and there, sprinkled. 
Um, but if it weren't for the the if it weren't for the etchy like. Either way, Dark Gathering's way better. So go if you're gonna look, if you're gonna watch a show, watch Dark, Dark Gathering. I don't think animation wide wise Dark Gathering's really great, but it, it it nails the horror like the entire time, and it doesn't let go. So, anyways, Mysterious Experiences, solid show. Check that out. That's interesting to you. That's it. We'll wrap it up there. I think. Um, let me let me double check my list. We did Kaiju number eight, Dungeon Meshi, Train of the End of the World. Banished Former Hero, A Sal Ball of Eccentrics, Girls Band Cry, Oi Tombo, Utoi Satra, Tanari, and Mr. Yes. Okay. What do we have left, Chris? I have no idea. We have Mushoko Tensei Season 2 Part 2, Gogo Loser Ranger, Sound Euphonium 3, Appraisal Skill, Demon Slayer, uh, Training Arc or whatever, Tsukimichi Second Season, Daily Live 5. Uh, maybe Sandland the series if I ever finish that damn show. It's like a, I've been having the last three episodes sitting there for like literally months. Uh, Yuru Camp season three and Duke of Death season three. It, then the, the next the next podcast is going to be the the sequels. It's just all the sequels. Yeah. Good luck finishing. You, you said you already got Tsukimichi done. How close are you to finishing Mushoko? I got past. That'll be a heartbreak if that's not one you finish. <laughs> I'm I I still have to go through the heading into the desert. I just got done with uh, Norn's episode, so you're halfway through it. I think that's about halfway through halfway point. Yeah, that that would be a, that'll be a fun review. Um, I might actually do a video review of that this week. I, I plan on doing one of this week. Um, it's just gonna be an odd one to kind of review because it's like you can't. That one's kind of a that's kind of one you can't really review without spoiling things. So it's gonna be a full on spoiler review, but. I'm gonna give my all my thoughts on that, and I think that'll be a that'll be a good video. But yeah, anyways, that's 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 it. Hope you guys enjoyed this run through of shows for the spring 2024 anime season. Uh, if you did before you leave, make sure to leave us a review on podcast platforms. Hit the like button at, on YouTube, all that good stuff. Uh, again, at, at tacospear.com is where we go for our links, social media links, ways to get a hold of us, going to support us. If you're on YouTube in the description, there's a way to support us there. Greatly appreciate it, but it supports the channel means a lot to us. And until next time, y'all take care. Os.